miles of a commercial sterilizer. There are also more than 10,000 schools and childcare centers in this area. While not everyone who lives within five miles may be exposed to hazardous levels of ETO, our analysis sought to understand the communities that may be impacted. We found that 12 metro areas across the US, there are quote, sterilizer hotspots with two or more sterilizers less than 10 miles apart. We also found that the air toxics cancer risk in the census tracts with sterilizers is three times greater than the US average. Our analysis also found there was a higher proportion of people of color, people with low income, and people who speak English as a second language in communities with, within five miles of sterilizers when compared to the US average. Latina communities are particularly impacted. There are five sterilizers in US-Mexico border communities and seven in Puerto Rico. As EPA knows, four of these seven had ETO concentrations that exceeded EPA's acceptable risk threshold. This is unacceptable. Furthermore, we observed a significant local level disparity. Nearly 60% of commercial sterilizers are in communities with a higher proportion of people of color compared to county averages. The air toxics cancer risks were also greater in census tracts with a higher proportion of people of color. In some, people of color appear to be disproportionately at risk of exposure to ETO emissions, face elevated cancer risks from air toxics, and are in communities that are more likely to have multiple sterilizers. With this in mind, we're here to echo our support for the ask made by the people who live, work, and play in these communities, many of whom did not know until recently or still don't know that a facility emitting a cancer-causing gas is in their community. We're encouraged by the proposals to expand coverage to on-site warehouses and other previously excluded processes, as well as consideration of room air emissions. We also strongly support EPA's decision to continue relying on the best available science and using the 2016 IRIS risk assessment to set emission standards. However, we strongly urge EPA to require fence line monitoring at all sterilizers. As stated in the proposal, many communities have requested fence line monitoring and evidence suggests these data can help protect communities. For example, the South Coast AQMD in California recently required a sterogenics facility to cease operations because fence line monitoring levels exceeded the state's action level. And this is at a facility that has installed permanent total enclosure. Fence line monitoring saves lives. Furthermore, the rule should cover offsite warehouses. Many companies transport sterilized medical equipment to warehouses that are not subject to Clean Air Act regulations. In effect, these warehouses act as secondary aeration chambers where the sterilized equipment continues to off gas. Commercial sterilizers should be required to report where these offsite warehouses are located and how much equipment is stored in them. There should also be required monitoring to protect workers at these facilities and the community. Finally, we urge EPA to maintain an expedited timeline of at most 18 months for implementation of the rule to explicitly consider cumulative impacts of ETO and other air toxics in enforcement of this rule and to ensure that information regarding this rule and the risk to communities is communicated in appropriate languages, especially Spanish. While I absolutely recognize the importance of medical steril supply sterilization, I ask that you consider the cruel irony of harming a community's health for the health of others. In this conversation regarding stronger emission standards, we must also consider phasing out the use of ETO where it is safe to do so. Safer alternatives exist. It is not necessary to sterilize spices with ETO, and many medical devices can be safely sterilized with substances like hydrogen peroxide. Thank you for your consideration. And thank you for your testimony. Now, you mentioned a study at the beginning of that. Will you be submitting that to the record? Yes. Docket. All right. And with that, I had I'll open up to any of the panelists have questions. Thank you again for taking the time today to provide your testimony. Our next speaker is Laura Schumau. Good morning. I'm Laura Schumau with the American Spice Trade Association, representing the U.S. spice industry. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. First of all, I would like to reiterate our comment deadline extension requests. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to offer comments on both the PID and the proposed NESHAP regulations. These proposals outline extensive new restrictions that will have a major impact on the spice industry and involve highly technical issues that most must be carefully evaluated. 60 days is simply not sufficient to meaningfully evaluate and comment. As such, we are requesting that the comment period be extended by at least 90 days. Critically, we request that stakeholders be notified of any extensions well in advance of the comment deadline by at least 30 days so that we may plan accordingly. 
The spice industry supports EPA's goals of protecting public health, and we have embraced the goal of reducing ETO emissions through the work we have done over the last 20 years to reduce emissions and identify alternatives, while still ensuring spices are treated to control food safety hazards. To this end, we support some of EPA's proposed new requirements, such as adopting cycles that are less than 500 milligrams per liter. However, ETO remains critical for keeping spices safe and complying with FDA regulations, such as the FSMA regulations, which require that food manufacturers have a validated process to control hazards such as salmonella. Importantly, there are not currently viable treatment alternatives for all spice products, and where alternatives exist for some spices, there are serious limitations. Steam and irradiation are capable of performing the necessary microbial reduction for salmonella. However, both have significant limitations and without the availability of ETO, there would not currently be sufficient total capacity to treat the entire spice supply. In the PID, EPA is proposing a phased cancellation of ETO use on spices without documentation showing that alternatives are not viable and the need for ETO is critical to food safety. As to plans to submit a list of spices for which there are not alternatives, however, it is still unclear what is meant by documentation that would be sufficient to demonstrate this need. Where any uses are canceled, the industry will still need a number of years to identify, research, and implement new alternatives. Further, EPA is proposing canceling the associated tolerances for spices and dried vegetables where uses are canceled. ASTA adamantly opposes the cancellation of these tolerances, which also cover imported commodities and are essential for global trade. Revoking tolerances for ETO residues on spices and dried vegetables will create massive supply chain disruption and compliance challenges for the entire spice industry, a scenario that our industry saw play out in the European Union in the last few years. There is no reason to cancel the import tolerance for spices, particularly when EPA has concluded in their own words, that dietary risks from exposure to ETO and its reaction products in food and drinking water are not of concern. In meetings with EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs in January, ASTA was notified that EPA did not plan to change the import tolerances for spices, so we were shocked to see the proposal included this revocation, which there's no public health reason for and would create massive disruption to our industry. Additionally, the proposed timelines for industry to comply with the engineering controls are not feasible and need to be extended. And we have many other issues that we plan to address in our comments, assuming that we have sufficient time to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. And thank you for your comments. Um, I it did mention some pieces there um, that we also will post in here, there is actually a second docket for the PID. So uh, we will get that posted in the chat box. Um, with that, are there any other questions from the panelists? And thank you for taking the time to provide your uh, testimony. Um, I would ask uh, before we uh, invite our next two speakers that uh, please, uh, when, when you're providing your testimony, speak uh, slowly so that the Spanish interpretation can stay with your uh, with your comments. Uh, our next two speakers are Nam Nguyen and Celeste Flores, and we'll begin with Nam. Hello, thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to come to the presentation today. And I think my first one, I'm really quick to tell you, you guys did a good job since 1970, and you did a lot of things to protect our environment and our human health. And I have a couple of questions for concerning is, in the European country and the rest of the world, they banned this since 1991, and they, even Germany, they did in 1981. And only us, Indian, uh, India, Canada, and US still using it. And the EPA know this, since 19, 2016, this is the most dangerous chemical. Then we continue to allow it to happen until now, and we're going to do something about that. And it, this stuff is very, and, and also EPA also found out 23 companies in our country. They did some violation of this kind of chemical. My concern is not the present moment right now, the long term. What happened if they, the thing is leaking out? 
to the environment, to the land, to the water, and how long is it if you clean it up? But what happened the long-term side effect? I hear it's about DNA, affect the human DNA, and also reproduction process, and cause cancer to the people. But the long-term, why don't we just follow the full step of the European country, just bang this stuff? We can find an alternative solution. And we kind of to, to do that. I think you try to do a good job to reduce it. But, but you know, our government system is a little different. Every four years, we have a new administration. They can change the process and they can hold the process and create a more future problem for us. And that, that suffering, we know it, and the world, we know that. And we kind of do to allow it to happen. The long term consequences might concern it. Uh, because I'm, I'm working to protect our planet Earth, and you also very focused on global warming also too. And D, they call the collateral damage. It's very dangerous thing that I concern the most. And the, the bottom, I don't want to take the full four minutes, but the bottom thing, I think you guys did a good job and kind of do a good job and have more public hearing like this. It help community and try to inform much more information about the dangerous thing. And the other thing we can do to to resolve the issue. But time is the most dangerous thing, the long-term consequences. Like some speaker mentioned earlier, this is the people live surrounding community and no air. What happened? You say you clean up. And I just saw some uh, unrata, uh, some facility, they leak in information too. And they shut down and they pay about $200,000. $200, but you talk about human life. It's not just one single human. So many of them people live around that. And they get DNA changing, reproduction positive. They can pass on their children and children in the future. So uh, I hope uh, you kind of to do this and try to protect us and kind of to do a good job. Uh, that's all I have to say today. So thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time to provide your testimony. Um, before I call our next speaker, I ask again that uh, when you start your uh, testimony, you say your first and last name and spell them out for a for the transcription. Um, and our next speaker is Celeste Flores. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, good morning. My name is Celeste Flores, C-E-L-E-S-T-E-F-L-O-R-E-S. And I'm a steering committee member of Clean Power Lake County, and I'm here to share the story of over 88,000 residents living in Waukegan, Illinois, an environmental justice community. This community is made up of immigrants, low income, and working class families. As we all know, African American and Latinx communities are disproportionately affected by corporate, corporate polluters, and Waukegan is no different. We have a retired coal plant with active coal ash ponds in the Waukegan's lakefront which was the largest air polluter in Lake County, Illinois. There are also five Superfund sites, and the community is currently dealing with ethylene oxide being omitted into our air by two facilities, Medline in Waukegan, Illinois, and Vantage in Gurney. ETO is not only being omitted in Waukegan, but also in Gurney, Illinois, a community of 31,000 residents, a village where I received my pre-K through 12th grade education, and where I returned after receiving my bachelor's degree. It's the city where I chose to put down roots and became a homeowner. Growing up, I never questioned the quality of the air I breathe. It wasn't until I moved back to Waukee to Gurney after receiving my bachelor's degree that I learned about the contamination caused by pollution spewing from the coal fire plant on the lakefront in Waukee. After this discovery, I've dedicated myself to a just transition for the workers and the closure of the plant. After five years of working on this, imagine my shock when I received a phone call from a reporter asking me if I knew what ethylene oxide was, and then to learn that I have and continue to live less than three miles from two facilities emitting significant levels of ETO. Today, I'm here to remind the EPA um, about your mission to protect human health and environment. To accomplish this mission, the agency is tasked to develop and enforce regulations. Today, we're focusing on the proposed ethylene oxide sterilizer rule. And although I'm grateful that the EPA is finally revisiting the sterilizer rule and uplifting and uplifting that the rule includes that all commercial sterilizers are required to get a Title V permit, this rule does not go far enough. This rule does not regulate off-site warehouses. The rule excludes research and development facilities. It's critical for everyone's community to have no risk of breathing ETO. Um, community members should not have to understand the risk of living in a community where ETO is being omitted. 
The rule does not require frontline monitoring. I will never know how much ETO is being omitted into the air because before local government paid for temporary fence line monitoring after the EPA failed to step up and pay for it. Yet the EPA had no problem paying for fence line monitoring in Willowbrook, Illinois. The EPA is failing its mission of protecting human health and the environment by not requiring fence line monitoring. The EPA needs to be proactive in protecting human health and the environment. That comes in the form of having the strongest rules the EPA should be working with the FDA to consider phasing out the use of ethylene oxide and medical device sterilizer industry. The EPA cannot be satisfied with 80% reduction of the ETO when your own research has shown it causes cancer. My community needs your protection and the time to act in this role is now. It's not fair that we will never know how much ETO we have been breathing. And although we've had state legislation step in, this needs to be addressed at the EPA level. This is where the most work can be done. Um, it's not safe to breathe any of this, and I should not have to live with the risk of knowing that I live three miles from a facility, and I shouldn't be asked to leave to breathe clean air. I used to love walking around in my community, and I don't anymore. I drive 15 minutes to Libertyville, Illinois to walk around at that forest preserve rather than the forest preserve that's minutes away from me because I know ETO is being omitted into my air. The EPA has known for far too long that ethylene oxide causes cancer and we can't just reduce. We need the EPA Excuse me. to so, be looking so, at so, so last year, Thank you, you, you for paid. your time. Uh, thank you. All right, our next speaker is Maya Nye. I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And I, I'm going to apologize before you start, Maya. I, I seem to have lost my video, but uh, so, but please continue. Hi, my name is Dr. Maya Nye. We spell that M-A-Y-A-N-Y-E. I'm the Federal Policy Director for Coming Clean, and uh, we're a nonprofit collaborative network of around 150 health environmental fence line community scientific and other organizations and experts that are working to transform the chemical industry so that they're no longer a source of harm. We're guided by the vision of a safe and healthy environment that's outlined in the Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals at louisvillecharter.org. And we recommend that the EPA look to this document and accompanying policy papers for guidance in developing rules to achieve the agency's mission. I'm also a former fence line resident, much like uh, Ms. Flores that spoke before me um, of a chemical facility that for decades has released massive amounts of ethylene oxide, far exceeding the 100 and a million cancer risk into my community, where my friends, my family, and my other loved ones still live, work, play, and pray. And um, I have a family member whose life altering health conditions is likely resulting from their career as a cleaner at a medical facility where they used ethylene oxide to sterilize the equipment. And so I'm here today in solidarity with those who are adversely experiencing health harm pollution from ethylene oxide commercial sterilizers, um, and particularly communities like uh, Celeste's and other environmental justice communities that are disproportionately experiencing this pollution on top of other, uh, other magnitudes of um, experiences. And so um, I wanna lift up the comments from, um, from my colleagues, uh, Celeste and Daria Manovia earlier. And I wanna add the additional points just to say that the only acceptable cancer and other health risk to, me to communities is zero, is none. And that is the level that EPA really needs to be striving towards. And, uh, and sterilizers are only one type of facility that contribute to the health harming pollution in communities where they're located. And looking at cancer and other health risks in this sort of segmented regulatory way downplays the real danger that communities and workers inside the facilities are facing. So EPA really needs to be taking more of a cumulative approach and frankly, a little bit more of a cohesive approach in this and the other rulemakings that regulate hazardous air pollutants like ethylene oxide to address these health hazards that are posed across these different rules and across the different mediums. Um, the proposed rules should be expanded to cover other processes. And as my colleagues before me have mentioned, fence line monitoring 
offsite warehouses and research and development sources should all be um, addressed in this rule and they should be required um, to be addressed in this rule. And, um, and I also want to really commend the EPA for requiring safer alternatives to ethylene oxide where they're known to exist. EPA should continue that strategy across the board and specifically to the other rules pertaining to ethylene oxide and the other hazardous air pollutants that uh, are significant health hazards regardless of the medium in which they travel. And um, I want to thank you for proposing these long overdue updates to this and to the other rules related to the health harms that sterilizer communities and communities like mine face from these pollutants. And we eagerly await additional proposed rules on the polyether polyols production, uh, smaller chemical manufacturers that, known as area sources, and hospital sterilizers. And we hope that you provide uh, these particular rules the same level of public facing attention as you have to this rule. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about those. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Nunn. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time today, Dr. Dr. Nunn. Our next speaker is uh, Rita Beving. Uh, yes, it's Rita Beving. And that is spelled B as in boy, E as in Edward, V as in Victor, I and G as in girl. Um, again, my name is Rita Beving and I live in Dallas, Texas. I've been a community advocate in, D in the Dallas area, both as a volunteer and professionally with several nonprofits for more than 25 years. Uh, I am concerned about ethylene oxide being used and released from both large and small commercial sterilizer plants. And upon hearing about the spice industry today, I'm concerned about what other sources may not have been included in this proposed rule. In DFW, there are two companies, Sterogenics and Cosmed, in the Grand Prairie area that use tons of ethylene oxide, just east of Highway 360 and south of the DFW airport. Uh, and before I comment on the rule, I have to tell the agency how disappointed I am to learn that EPA meetings were held in Texas in plants like Laredo and Athens, and yet failed to have any kind of meetings for those communities in Grand Prairie, less than a 20 minute drive from the EPA headquarters of region six. And these two plants are located in a disadvantaged community that is probably 70% minority that live in the shadows of not just one plant, but two. Again, almost two miles apart. I frankly would like an explanation for, from the agency of why this didn't happen. But moving forward to the rule, I will tell you I do appreciate the fact that you are addressing strengthening the rules surrounding these plants. I am pleased that you are including both major and minor sterilizer facilities in this rule. However, the rule does fall short in several ways. First, the community risk analysis was incomplete in not providing a full picture of these plants emissions. The analysis should have been revised to include not only the sterilizers and where they are located, but also the off-site secondary storage areas or warehouses to provide a more complete picture of the overall health risks. Second, these off-site storage areas of these chemicals need to be included within the rule. All possible emissions from these plants including the emissions that could be from secondary sources of, that are utilized by these sterilizers should be restricted and monitored. Third, fence line monitoring as mentioned before needs to be required in the rule. And just as the e agency requires MA max standards for many polluting industries, the EPA should use the most state-of-the-art technology to do the monitoring of these plants. After all, we're tar talking parts per trillion, not parts per million. And in conclusion, the compliance date should be shortened 
from 18 months to a shorter time frame. The longer we delay the implementation for compliance, the longer the high risk we impose upon these communities that have been dealing with this for decades. In the long run, we need to find a better and safer solution to sterilize medical equipment. And um, I hope you will also include those other facilities outside of sterilizers that use ethylene oxide. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? But thank you again, Ms. Beving, for taking the time today to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Daniel Savory and Atenis Mania. And we'll begin with uh, Daniel Savory. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've had it right the first time. Uh, Daniel Savory, Savory uh, S A V E R Y. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and I'm a senior legislative representative with Earth Justice in Washington, D.C. I want to start by saying that this rule includes some important improvements that communities impacted by ETO have been calling for, including by treating minor sources the same as major sources, including by requiring all facilities to have a Title V permit, and by conducting a residual risk review to ensure that the health of communities is better protected. However, this proposed rule contains some significant omissions that will lead to the continuation of significant emissions. The offsite warehouses others have spoken to typically have high emissions. They are really just additional aeration chambers. For example, one warehouse in Georgia had estimated annual emissions of 5,600 pounds of ETO, enough to require its own air permit. Now, EPA has stated that this rule will reduce the cancer risk to communities by 80%. However, by not including these offsite aeration warehouses, the agency has neither identified the significant risks from these sites, nor is proposing to reduce those risks. In fact, by including on-site warehouses and not off-site ones, the rule will likely make the problem worse by incentivizing facilities to move all of their sterilized medical equipment off-site. This is simply unacceptable. How can EPA ensure that communities are protected from the cancer risk of ETO while not regulating these offsite aeration warehouses? Now, the proposed rule was supposed to come out a year ago. Uh, then it was supposed to come out last fall. And part of the reason we were told that the rule was taking as long as it did was because of all the information collection re request responses the agency had to sift through. Of course, this was the second ICR the EPA did for this rule after only requesting information from six sterilizers the first time around. So it was a, a bit frustrating to review the responses to the ICR and see ICRs and see very little information on the offsite aeration warehouses. I reviewed around a half dozen of the ICR submissions from the 23 facilities that EPA identified last summer as high risk. Of those, only one actually publicly listed the location of its warehouse. Some were blank and others listed these fields as confidential business information. What is CBI about the location of a warehouse? Why were these facilities able to list the information as CBI while others didn't? And why didn't EPA go back to the facilities that left this field blank, not as non-applicable, and ask them to fill out the information correctly? I want to urge EPA in the strongest way possible to make all this information publicly available so that communities know all sources of ETO exposure. We were particularly disappointed and, and frankly a bit shocked that the proposed rule did not include fence line monitoring, particularly after the Han rule, which also addresses ETO pollution and was released just days before this rule, did include fence line monitoring. And respectfully, it was rather misleading for EPA to suggest in last night's webinar that the continuous emissions monitoring system that the agency has proposed to mandate will monitor fugitive emissions. Yes, it will monitor those emissions inside the facility, but it is the fugitive emissions outside the facility that EPA itself has said are what is driving the cancer risk to communities. Fence line monitoring is the only way for communities and EPA to know whether or not individuals are protected from ETO pollution, period. And just like with the Han rule, there should be a health protective action level such that when facilities ex exceed that level, they will have to address it. And the compliance date for the proposed rule is 18 months, but I want to urge EPA to shorten this timeline. Some facilities, like the Erie facility, uh, has been open since 1989, the Memphis facility since 1976. 18 months after the rule is finalized next year is far too long. 
The industry has known for years that these regulations were coming, and the only surprise to them should be that it has taken this long. We want to urge EPA to shorten this timeline as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony, Mr. Savory. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time today. Our next speaker is Atinas Mania. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you so much. So good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am the Environmental Health Director of Cleaner Now, an environmental justice organization in Kansas City. I'm also here as a nurse. I have a background in nursing. I'm a first generation Mexican American and a Kansas Cityan uh, born and raised. I want to begin by stating my support in phasing out as much as we can ethylene oxide since it is a known carcinogen. We know ethylene oxide is associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, myeloma, lympho uh, lymphocytic leukemia, and breast cancer in women, of which we know those rates continue to be going up. Children and people who work at facilities producing ethylene oxide face an elevated cancer risk. In Kansas City, we have American Contract Systems, which is a commercial sterilizer of the nearly 146,000 people that live within five miles of this facility, 44% are people of color, 42% are low income. And there are approximately 116 schools and childcare centers in this area. I'm concerned about these same people because they are not just exposed to ethylene oxide, but so many other pollutants and contaminants because of environmental racism in this country. These same families live near the Hawthorne coal plant, other chemical facilities, heavy freight that comes in and out of their neighborhoods and is sliced by highways, and they're also next to the second largest rail yard of the nation. This is what I call and what many people know of as cumulative impacts. So I am asking for EPA to protect human health and the environment by requiring the most stringent emission controls with proper regulations and accountability and prioritize environmental justice communities that are already being dumped by toxins and experiencing cumulative impacts from such inhumane practices. We must require fence line monitoring for insurance and transparency. We cannot know what we're breathing if there's not that fence line monitoring and Cleaner now has established other types of fence line monitoring because EPA has uh, unfortunately not been able to do the proper monitoring of even just a basic of PM 2.5 in our communities. So this is why we need to be able to monitor all of these other chemicals and toxins that we're being exposed to, especially if we know the same communities are already being exposed to many others. We must fight for multilingual information on the facilities and risks to surrounding communities because we know in the United States, English is not the only language that is spoken. And I am appreciative that EPA today is able to have um, Spanish translation, but that's just the start. And we have many other languages that our families speak and they have just as much of a right as anyone else to know what their exposure is. Also, this rule is not accounting for, and as you've heard from many others, the offsite warehouses that ethylene oxide is being transported to without proper monitoring of off gassing. So those workers aren't even aware of their risk or have the proper personal, personal protective equipment. There are safer alternatives that we need to navigate and determine so that way we can not only ensure uh, the safety of our patients, but also the safety of our communities. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? All right. Um, seeing as my camera doesn't seem to want to cooperate today, I'm going to hand uh, the chair uh, position off to Jenny Noonan, who has started this, uh, introduced herself at the beginning of this hearing, um, and she will introduce our next two speakers. Thank you so much, David, and I'm sorry about your, your computer today. Um, thanks, everyone, for um, all the testimony we've heard already. Our next two speakers are going to be Rayan uh, Makarim and Jane Williams, and I apologize for, as David had, for any um, mispronunciations, and please, please correct me. Um, Ryan, could you, would you be up first? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. So my name is Ryan Makarem, R-A-Y-A-N-M-A-K-A-R-E-M. I am the climate policy advocate for uh, Clean Air Now here in Kansas City. Uh, we are, like Athenas before me said, we are an environmental justice uh, organization and we are born of our community, a community that has suffered decades of cumulative impacts from a variety of sources, rail yards, industry, and uh, now we are discussing also ethylene oxide, our another silent uh, potential danger, not potential, a known danger. Uh, the rule that EPA is proposing, as many have said before me, is long overdue, and we hope that this rule will be uh, passed and even go beyond that and not just require stronger emission controls, uh, but if we can strive to eliminate it completely, because we are all scientists and we know that there are alternatives. So we don't have to just reduce ethylene oxide. We don't just have to reduce the risk by 80% of cancer because any risk is not acceptable. So we want it to be completely removed from our society, from our community. So I understand that this rule is not going that far, but I hope and I hope that we can really go beyond that and that we can eliminate it completely. And as for the industry requiring longer time to comment and longer time to implement, I respectfully disagree because industry uh, is aware of these risks. They have known that this change is coming. So they have profited it. They have profited from this for a long time. So at the cost of our health and our community, so I don't think they need more time. I think they should have been doing this already without us requiring them through this rule, but it is unfortunate that it has come to that. Uh, as I said, no risk is acceptable. So I want this to be completely eliminated as soon as possible if we can. Uh, just to reiterate a two, two more things, we would like this rule to include the fence line monitoring as previously mentioned, because our communities are always the last to know and the risks to our community do not come just from monitoring what's inside the facility, but it also comes from all these emissions that are going out into the community. So fence line monitoring is a must, it's a requirement. It should be provided for in this rule and paid for by uh, our federal tax dollars so that the community is protected from the impacts of this. And last comment from me would be, as my director said previously, a lot of the communities impacted are low income people of color, immigrant communities that, and a lot of them do not speak English or have English as a second language. So communication is vital and important to our communities in multiple languages, uh, up to date live updates. As soon as something happens at a facility or there are any emissions, usually our communities are the last to know. They will know after everyone else has known in the state, for example. So this importance of having our communities in the know, have them involved in all of these protection plans and having them know that there are risks to them and any time is very important. And I hope that EPA can implement that into the rule uh, to protect our community. So reduce, eliminate, inform, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Any questions from the panel? Okay, thank you again. Up next, we have Jane Williams. Good morning, thank you so much. So um, I wanna compare and contrast a little bit this rule with other rules that EPA has done or is planning on, on issuing. So the refinery rule requires the refiners to pay for fence line monitoring. Um, in most states, fence line monitoring is made available to the public um, so that the public can understand what those emissions are looking like and how those emissions might be affecting public health and how they can then advocate with their local regulators to make sure that the emissions are having, have, are having a downward trend. So, um, so we have fence line monitoring already in the, in the federal rule for refineries. Um, now, with the chemical manufacturing rules, we have three rules, group one, polymers and resins, group two, and hazardous organic niche app that are also proposing fence monitoring. And the reason that EPA is proposing this monitoring is because it is a control strategy. Um, when EPA issued the final rules for the refinery rule, 
with the FinSign monitoring included, it said that FinSign monitoring was a control technology. It's not just a monitoring technology. It's a way to reduce pollution. And so it is very puzzling to me how we can have the sterilizer rule where the risks it's exceed. In many instances, if you look at a community and you look at what's coming off the warehouses that are usually within a mile of the sterilizer and what's coming off the sterilizer, the combined risk of that exceed that of a refinery and in some cases, even a chemical manufacturing facility. But we're not proposing a off the shelf control technology. We're not proposing you need to use that here. And that's FinSign monitoring. The other thing that is very puzzling to me is that um, the cavity ring down mass spec has been in use for over a half a decade and was developed over the last decade. It has been extensively peer reviewed by the Office of Research and Development. And um, it can detect ethylene oxide in orders of magnitude below other technologies. And so I don't, I'm very baffled why the rule pretends that that new monitoring technology doesn't exist. And depending on how long you want your monitoring to go on for, if you want it to go on for 15 seconds or a minute or three minutes or four minutes, you can drive the detection limit down for ethylene oxide to below 50 parts per trillion. And so the other thing that is really alarming to me is that the, the um, stack rates, the 10 ppb stack rate was basically set on a method detection limit. Well, the method detection limit is 50 years old because you're, you're using very old, very old technology and basing your method detection limit on very old technology. And so I think it's important that for the fence line monitoring, you look at what's actually available and what's in use right now, which is cavity ring down mass spec. Uh, there's three separate vendors. It's not like there's just one vendor. It's widely used, um, not just for ethylene oxide monitoring, but also for other VOC monitoring. And then to, to say in this rule that you're basically only going to focus it on the sterilization facilities and not what are essentially secondary aeration, which are the warehouses, you will actually shift the risk from the sterilizers to the secondary aeration facilities as you crack down on emissions from the one, you'll just move them to the other. So the rule must include the warehouses and it must include fence monitoring because it is a technological development that we know reduces pollution at the fence line into, into these highly impacted communities. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Jonathan, Matt, any questions? Okay, great, we appreciate that. Um, up next, our next speaker will be Kevin Priest. Thank you for joining us. You're on mute. Hi, my name is Kevin Price, P-R-E-I-S. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, my wife and my kids. Um, imagine for a moment that they're your family and that they're at real risk every day that goes by and that there's a company running a facility nearby and that this company has proven in the past that it will do the bare legal minimum, game the system, pay minor fines, even pay a legal settlement as long as it gets to stay operational and profitable. Now imagine that the thing that's protecting their health is a governmental agency willing to make common sense rules and to enforce them. That's our situation. And it's the reason why I would like the new rules to be revised as follows. Twice a year reporting for emissions and monitoring is simply too infrequent. Months will have passed between these reports and during that time, releases from facilities could be doing incredible harm. Bad actors will have too much time to game the system as some companies are doing currently. To address this, I ask that the EPA require emissions detectors to be networked into a website and the facilities provide real-time ongoing monitoring that's publicly available. If my kids and I are in danger, we deserve to know immediately, not every six months. And if companies are not abiding the rules, the EPA needs to know and act as soon as possible, not with information that's coming twice a year. Second, in facilities that use ETO, 
require the installation of both stack detectors and perimeter detectors, fence line monitoring. Stacks are not the only source of available uh, of potential leaks. Fence line monitoring is necessary, and without it, you're wasting your effort guarding the front door and leaving the back door open. This type of testing provides greater security to the community. Third, I ask that you establish clear guidelines for storage at off-site warehouses, not just attached warehouses. Off-site warehouses that store materials sterilized with ETO are a risk to the community as well. I agree that without rules and clarity for off-site warehouses, you'll just see more of these warehouses and more companies finding ways, legal ways, to get around your intended protections. You cannot assume all companies will do the right thing when we have clear evidence from those that do not. And finally, fourth, significantly increase the financial and legal penalties for non-compliance and for releases beyond safe amounts. All of the rest of this is theater without enforcement. Our health is priceless and the penalties need to reflect this. When these facilities don't act in the best interest of the community, they shouldn't be operating in the community. Thank you for your time and for your attention to this issue. Thank you so much for your testimony this morning. Jonathan, Matt, any questions? We appreciate you taking the time. Okay, at this time, I do not see anyone else in the queue. Um, and so if anyone who would like to testify, even if you haven't registered, if you would like to, um, in the chat, contact attendee support, we will um, be happy to take, take, uh, your, take, take your testimony. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna take, oh, I see uh, Joanna Curies. Yes. Would you like to testify? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, and okay, I would, great. would you, if, if you want, you can turn your camera on. If you don't, that's fine too. But if you could uh, start and spell your name and sure. uh, we can be happy to take your testimony. Okay. Well, my name is Joanna uh, Klistek and it's spelled C-H-L-Y-S like Sam T-E-K. And, you know, I, I, I wanted to share just a little bit about who I am here because um, um, you know, first of all, I'm a mother of two and I live in the Willowbrook area here in the Chicago. And um, I have worked very hard um, against uh, sterigenics um, because of all the exposure, um, of all the ETO exposure that we have experienced as a community. But I want you to know that it has affected me and my family personally. Uh, we have lost a child, an unborn child, because of this exposure some time ago. And I have been exposed in my family for, for years. I mean, sterogenics, until they closed, they were in the area for 35 years. And we only lived, you know, with proximity-wise, only a mile away. So, you know, what I want to make sure that everyone hears again is that no amount of ETO is safe. It just it just isn't. And the European Union banned it for a reason. So uh, when I hear comments from the industry asking for more time, it is extremely frustrating for me to hear that because this has been known uh, for years. Some countries have addressed this so quicker and better than us. Um, so I do have a prepared statement uh, and I want to quickly address it. And I, you know, it's, it's going to be something that you already heard before, but I want to talk about fence line monitoring and the rule. Um, so, you know, we know that EPA has a trusted method for ambient air monitoring. The Han proposal for manufacturers require fence line monitoring using method 327, which includes standards for the number of canister their placements and the action thresholds. Sterilizers should also be monitored for compliance with the rules set forward in the proposal. The self-reporting and reliance on design and assumptions in the, proposals, in the proposal is not enough. Uh, there are no accountability standards in the proposal that communities can trust. Um, in addition, I want to talk about off-gassing and aeration uh, locations, uh, warehouses, and how that's affected, because we know that was a huge deal here in Willowbrook with sterogenics, where they were off-gassing for years and no one knew about this. 
So there are still parts of the steriliz sterilization and fumigation process um, that we have to discuss. Industry will use these um, offsite locations to skirt emissions, as I mentioned, uh, if they're not included in the rule. We know that fugitives are a huge concern. If warehouses aren't included, the fugitives will just be spread out over slightly larger geography and the uncontrolled and accounted, and they were, and the all gassing will be unaccounted for. Um, I have many other things to share, but I'm probably gonna run out of time. So I just wanted to thank you for the work that you're doing. And um, I just want to end with the statement that I started with, with that no amount of ETO exposure is before us. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your testimony and um, for, for you and for anyone else who has uh, thoughts, please, please submit your testimony also in a written format and we can put in the chat the process for doing that or a link to how to do that. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and if you wanna put your hand down, that would be great. Um, if there's anyone else who would like to, uh, if you're signed up for it tomorrow and you'd rather do it now, we'd be happy to take it. Or if you um, just feel moved to, to speak, we'd be happy to take your testimony. If you could either um, in the chat, talk to attendee support, send them a message. Or if you just want to raise your hand, I can also just call on you out of the, out of the, um, the list here. I'm just going to scan through the chat and see if anyone is raising their hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands at this moment. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that we take a 10 minute break. So let's return at 12.16. And um, I thank the panelists and I thank everyone who's testified so far today. And we look forward to uh, more uh, testimony in uh, the, the um, sessions to come. Thank you so much.
everyone. Welcome back. I've got just a couple of uh, reminders I want to uh, share with folks as we can. Hi, I want to uh, just remind everyone of a couple things. Again, I'm Jenny Noonan, and I'm the Director of Policy Analysis and Communications in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And um, I am chairing the session of today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce ethylene oxide emissions from commercial sterilization facilities. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, if just a reminder that if you could speak slowly so that we can make sure that um, the Spanish translation uh, is able to, to happen seamless, as seamlessly as possible. And also, um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we are preparing a transcript for the hearing and that will be available in the docket for the proposed rule. So that is just another thing to keep in mind. I'm going to um, remind everybody that if you'd like to, um, there is Spanish interpretation for this event. And uh, if you have an, to listen to the hearing in either English or Spanish, everyone need, will need to select a language at the bottom of your screen. And you can do that by clicking on the globe icon and then select either English or Spanish. Um, at this time, we don't have anyone else who is uh, signed up to speak at this time. So I would like to offer a couple of options for everyone who is listening. Um, if you would like to speak now, either because you, um, have a later spot or because you um, are just now learning of this and would really like to get your thoughts on the official record, we welcome that. And we we'll encourage folks to raise your hand if you're in the Zoom, um, or you can also uh, contact the, um, the attendee support, which should be at the top of the, the chat. Um, so I think, um, I'm going to give it another minute to allow folks to kind of mull that over. And then um, I think if I don't hear any, if I don't see anyone, I'll, I'll scroll through. Um, I will uh, call for another recess for a few minutes and allow other people who may have registered for a little bit later time slot to join us. Um, so I'm just going to check through here and see if I see any hands and um, welcome uh, if there are folks to, who would like to, don't see anyone right off. Oh, I see one, uh, Lauren Kessenberg. Hi, Thank yes, so Lauren Kessenberg. Hi, good afternoon. You would like to um, start by spelling your name. You'll mm -hmm. have four minutes and the, um, the, the light, there'll be a one minute warning and then a 30 second warning. Great. Yes. Hi, I'm Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, Caseberg, K-A-E-S-E-B-E-R-G. I am a resident of Darien, Illinois, which is next to Willowbrook, Illinois, and I was part of the Stop Sterogenics group here. And so um, by nature of us being so close to and growing up near a facility releasing ethylene, ethylene oxide for all these years, I um, sort of against my will became, you know, a quasi expert in this issue and what it can do to a community that lives near a facility releasing this chemical. Um, I want to thank you for the work and the time that you're putting into this. I want to thank you for the um, notifications that are being given to other communities um, so that they can have some awareness and knowledge, which is power. Um, I would encourage the agency to ensure that um, as these rules are, are made better and stronger and developed, um, that they include fence line monitoring and ambient air monitoring. And um, what we learned in our struggle within our community was that the self-reporting is not trustworthy from these companies and these facilities. Um, and that, you know, just testing from stacks and equipment monitors also is not reliable. The air quality was always different than what the stack testing showed it should be. So fence line monitoring, air, um, uh, ambient air monitoring, and then additionally, including any warehouse, including um, off-gassing facilities under the rule is required. Um, that's something that we would implore you to do. 
Um, sorry, my child is home sick today from school. So she's here. Just give me one second, baby. I'm almost done. Um, the other thing is, you know, having gone through this, having gone through this, um, one thing that I did is I set up a Google alert for ethylene oxide. And so I see these alerts and emails come through. It is shocking and sickening to me how many other countries ban the use of ethylene oxide on food and cosmetics. And we do nothing in this country to do that. And so we would also implore there to be, you guys to have some action on banning this substance in the food that we consume um, and in the cosmetics that we use. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Any questions from the panel? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any other folks who would like to testify? We have open space now. Um, we welcome your comments. Um, there are four minute slots. You can speak for the whole four minutes or less than that if you're interested. Um, but we are interested in, in having as many folks as possible comment on the record. If you don't feel comfortable testifying, as we put in the chat, um, there are many ways to send EPA your written comments. You can send them in an old fashioned letter. You can email them. You can um, put them in through the regulations.gov uh, website. There's a, a way to do that as well. So we encourage all of that for folks. And again, the deadline for that, uh, submitting your comments is June 12th. So any, I'm gonna scroll through again, and if you are interested in testifying, I encourage you to raise your hand. Not seeing any hand raises at this time. Oh, Neil Carmen. Thank you so much for joining us. I can barely hear you. I'm having an unfortunately, I may have to call back in. I'm having some audio problems with my Zoom. So uh, you're not you're not hearing me. I think I don't I will put yeah. on a phone. Okay, Neil, that if you're would perhaps be... trying to connect your phone instead of the computer audio. Okay, we'll we'll wait. We'll be here. We'll wait for you. And I'll I'll take if there's anyone else wants to testify, I'll I'll go ahead in the meantime, but we'll take you as soon as you arrive back, okay? Okay, I'm going to ask attendee support if they can mute Mr. Carmen, and then I'm going to return to the request for other folks who um, might like to um, provide testimony. And it's a, a slot of four minutes and we'll let you know when there's one minute left. We really appreciate everyone coming out today. And uh, while we're waiting for Mr. Carmen, I'll just describe what's happening over the next couple of days. So we will continue to, ha we have um, two more sessions of um, today's public hearing. And so we um, encourage folks that if you're, you're thinking about just fine, but you're not quite ready, you can, um, you can still register for that today. Um, I think the the next one starts at 1.30, and then there's one that starts, I think, at 5.30 today until 7. I think that's right. And someone can put it in the chat if I've got that wrong. And then tomorrow, we will start up again at 11 o'clock. Hello? Time. Hello, Mr. Carmen? Okay. Can you hear me? I can. I'm assuming this is Mr. Neil Carmen. Yes, this is. Yes. Uh, my name is Neil Carmen, N-E-I-L-C-A-R-M-A-N. I'm with the uh, Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club in Texas. I work on air quality for over 40 years, 12 years with the state of Texas. 
I'm very concerned about ethylene oxide from sterilizers because uh, they've been uh, very under-regulated, almost non-regulated, uh, and the communities that we've got a flock of them in Texas that do not know about these commercial sterilizers uh, in these uh, highly populated areas. They're often environmental justice communities. So it's very good. I thank EPA for, for what you're proposing. I think it needs to go further. Uh, the, uh, uh, the continuous emissions monitoring system um, can be, I think, enhanced. Uh, it could be a lot better. And, and as Jane Williams was alluding to, there is new technology uh, that EPA should seriously consider requiring uh, because um, it's not enough to just have the self-reporting. We want to make sure that there's very good um, ethylene oxide uh, air monitoring, uh, both inside the plant and also on the fence line, uh, because uh, any leaks can be a serious issue. Um, one of the uh, concerns I have is I have not seen EPA propose backup emergency generators. And I know as a state official, we required a facility that was causing serious problems when it had power failures. And power failures do occur. We see them uh, due to uh, surges, dips in the, in the grid, lightning strikes, thunderstorms. And so when that happens, then uh, these sterilizers are not going to have their pollution control systems operating. And so it is possible for them to put in um, a backup emergency electrical generator that can start up in 60 seconds. And I think this is something very critical because of the toxicity of the ethylene oxide. I think the off-site warehouses are a big concern. Um, I've seen this in the chemical industry, uh, and I've seen fires and other problems uh, here in Texas. So off-site warehouses need to be um, tracked and permitted and monitored under these rules. Uh, it's not appropriate to allow these folks to be kind of exempted from this sterilizer rule, and I don't ex expect the states to, to do much about that unless the EPA puts it into this rule. Um, so EPA needs to really take steps to reduce the risk of ethylene oxide exposures um, in these communities because we've seen that they uh, have a lot of uh, air emissions, uh, and, uh, and this is such a, a toxic chemical that it gets into the air, and, um, and there's been a lack of, of uh, monitoring both inside these plants and, and at the fence line. So communities uh, here in Texas have not really been informed by EPA uh, or the state um, clearly as to what their risks are with these chemicals. Uh, monitoring uh, is absolutely important uh, because if the plants don't do monitoring, then uh, they are going to do um, estimates of what they think their uh, uses and losses of the ethylene oxide are. And we've seen one, too many one problems. Okay, with ethylene oxide uh, incidents. And of course, you know, ex uh, workers are also being exposed to the ethylene oxide. And I do support what uh, EPA is proposing for the personal uh, protection equipment use. Uh, requirements for the workers. I think this is a very critical thing as well. I think EPA needs to speed up the implementation date. I mean, we're looking at two and a half years. I think that's not acceptable uh, since the communities have been waiting now, um, you know, over a, a decade to uh, get, you know, effective new um, NESHAPS regulations in place. Thank so you. I urge Thank EPA you. to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. We appreciate you working through the technology issues with us. Okay, um, we are interested in uh, Joe Payne. Would you like to testify? Yes, ma'am. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, if you like to turn on your camera, great. If you wouldn't, that's fine too. Um, you have four minutes and you may begin. Well, I'm sitting here in Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee, with my wife, who is dying of cancer. Uh, she was diagnosed only about two and a half to two and three quarter months ago with a, a cancer, a lung cancer called adenal carcinoma. And um, she didn't make it to the hospital in time, evidently, uh, before it reached the stage three and four. and 
Just want to turn around and show you a picture of her. We live 0.69 miles from Royal Sterilization Facility in New Tazewell, Tennessee, one of the 23 facilities, sterilization facilities that have been marked as the worst of releases of ethylene oxide. We live in a middle to upper class community. Uh, the Royal Industries is primarily one of the largest um, manufacturing uh, facilities in, in the community, a small community of probably 4,000. Uh, there has been no uh, movement whatsoever in bringing uh, the Royal plant to bear for some of the uh, cancers that have that are listed. Some of them are listed. The public meetings in October held in our community brought out uh, much of the information uh, that others have faced with those past cancers. I'm in the middle of uh, a suit against Royal Industries with one of the largest environmental firms in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, we are looking and they are investigating uh, Royal Industries uh, because of their fugitive releases not being reported. But uh, being in a conservative area, conservative state presents all kinds of problems. I work for Appalachian Voice in the Energy Democracy Program most recently and was a fellow with them. Uh, but this is, uh, this is just floored us as a family. Uh, it's not one of the cancers listed, uh, you know, as being a cancer that, uh, that is recognized as a uh, product of ethylene oxide, but um, lung cancer of any kind that uh, can't be explained like this cancer, uh, primarily uh, could very well be associated with that release. There's a Christian school of 100 located closer to that plant, and it's been there since 2004, the school has. The plant's been there for 19, since 1970, maybe 1980, <clears throat> and they haven't answered any of the questions brought up in the uh, public meetings. They've uh, they sent one statement to the local paper, and that's all that's been that's all that they've been able to explain. This is, they're working on it. You know, they've got their technicians working with EPA, evidently. But being in this this uh, being in a middle class, upper class neighborhood, it's a deterrent when it comes to situations like this. No one wants to talk about it. They put it to the side. And um, I really am proud that there are people that can organize, people that uh, are interested in their health and the environment, in the total environment, um, you know, that's shot to hell already. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm just uh, upset and I just wanted to voice my concern as to why. Um, this plant uh, seems to be getting by with a lot more than many of the other plants because uh, I would imagine they're very highly politically involved in state politics. But thank, uh, you. thank you, Mr. Payne. I, okay. I really want to thank thank you for for taking the time out of in a very difficult situation to come and talk to us today. We really appreciate that. And okay, um, you're welcome. My best to you. Thanks. Thank you. Now I'm going to look and see, um, Ms. Duffy, would you like to testify as well? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. If you could start and spell, spell your name uh, for the court reporter, that would be excellent. And you have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Diane Duffy, D-I-A-N-E-D-U-F-F-E-Y. And I live in a neighborhood is, that is literally across the street from a plant. Um, in Colorado that uses ETO. And I guess my comment is, I want you folks to really look at the total air quality. So if there's only one um, contributor 
of ETO into the air, then I think your um, emission levels um, can be fine-tuned and accurate. But if there's more than one contributor, I think we have to look at that a little differently. And maybe air monitors in the surrounding area can be uh, required because what the plant tells us is that they're way under the federal limits and that's great, but they also have um, informed us that there's other contributors, that there's other, um, other people in our direct um, area that are contributing to the ETO. So if we're looking at public health, and I think that's what we're looking at here, not just ETO uh, plants, I think we need to look at public health and say, what's the air quality? And if there's only one, fine. But if there's other contributors to it, whatever the contributors may be, maybe it's not another plant that's using ETO, but maybe it's a natural contributor because I... I'm understanding there is um, other ambient um, ETO, then maybe those limits need to be reduced for everyone in the area that's contributing. Because what we're really looking at is our air quality that we breathe and our public health. So I guess what works for one doesn't always work for all. And I want you folks to, to look at that and maybe require those air monitors right here by those by those areas that are troublesome. It's, does that make sense? We appreciate your thoughts on this. All right, thank you. Thank you, do any questions from the panel? Thank you so much for taking the time to, to share those thoughts. If there's anyone else who has not yet testified, um, even if you have a time later in the uh, this, an, in a later session, we welcome your uh, testimony now. If you just want to raise your hand or send an email to or send a go into the chat and chat attendee support. If you'd like to do that. I'm going to scroll through. Can I add one comment? It's hard to get in. Could you say a little more about that? We, we on the technical side? Um, I couldn't get the link. Um, I was on the YouTube, which is all I had. And quite frankly, there was a number of people on the YouTube in the chat that were saying, send me the link. How do I get into the Zoom meeting? And they couldn't, um, they couldn't find you. So there's a lot of other people who want to speak who aren't able to um, join this part. They're on the YouTube part. Okay, well, thank you for that feedback. Thank you very much for that. So we will make sure that we are, um, if you are on the YouTube um, channel, if we could, if someone from the, um, I understand that the information about how to register is, has been added to the YouTube chat. So if you are joining us via YouTube, please check that out. And um, if people want to uh, tell us that you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to speak, please email us at eto at epa.gov. So that's eto at the at sign epa.gov. And so that, that was another way. We, we do have availability for the two uh, sessions that are continuing today. And we also have a whole day tomorrow starting at 11 o'clock Eastern to 7 p.m. Eastern. And there are slots available then. And then I also just wanna mention that on Wednesday, uh, starting at 11 o'clock Eastern, we are going to uh, have uh, something we haven't tried before in the virtual world, which is a virtual walk-in, which means um, anyone who would like to uh, just join us, um, the link will be on the um, website and that would be epa.gov slash ETO. And you can look in the banner, we will be um, putting a link to the, the Wednesday public hearing, uh, Zoom link will be there. Um, 
notes. And we will also, again, have YouTube links. Uh, again, apologies for the, the mix up about those this morning. Um, so those are two more days of opportunities for people to join us. We, we welcome that. That's why we're here. Um, I also just want to mention for folks to remind everyone that you don't have to testify here in this format. This is not the only way. We strongly encourage folks to submit their comments in writing. Even if you've testified here, you can also do that. But if you just want to submit things in writing, you can email us. You can uh, send us something, a letter in the mail or there's a regulations.gov is a website where you can also submit comments and all of that information um, will be put in the chat for how to do that. It's also available on our website. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna ask if there's anyone else who would like to testify now. Jenny, there is uh, one more person who is registered, um, is now on the line, uh, Melissa. Great. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. Can, can you hear me? We can, and we can see you as well. Thank you. We'll, we will, um, you'll have four minutes and there'll be a, a little timer that'll tell you when you have one minute left. And um, if you could start by spelling your name for the court reporter, that would be great. Thank you. Um, C-I-G-A-R-R-O-A. Uh, my name is Melissa Cigarroa. I live in Laredo, Texas, and Midwest Sterilization operates one half mile to one mile from residential areas in my community. And schools in my community have been identified as being in the top 1% of risk associated with ethylene oxide exposure, according to a study conducted by the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. It's a, a PERI study, P-E-R-I. Community became concerned when ProPublica published a study um, about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years now, um, identifying Laredo as one of the highest risk communities for ethylene oxide exposure. Um, I, I think it's unique in, in the sense that uh, a couple of things. First, Midwest sterilization uses the largest amount of ethylene oxide amongst all the sterilizers sterilizer plants in the United States, according to the information that we found on the EPA site. Um, they were using 1.3 million pounds last year, and I assume that this year it's only going to increase according to what the company has shared with the community about receiving more orders because of closures of a, um, the sterogenics plant in Illinois. Um, 1.3 million pounds is more than all of the other sterilizer plants combined. So it is a significant amount. Um, they've only been operating since 2005, but what we don't want to see is our community following the steps of many other communities in, in the United States that have been uh, living next to sterilizer plants for over 20, 25 years and have seen the resulting cancer clusters occur. Of concern is that uh, two cancer cluster studies that my community requested from the Texas State Department, um, it's the Texas Department of State Health Services in July of 2022, also in October of 22, found that our medically underserved community has an elevated cancer risk to compare it to the state averages. So in July of 2022, the cancer cluster study observed a statistically significant risk in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma extranodal. And in the October 2022 study, um, this department observed a statistical significance in breast cancer and acute lymphocytic leukemia. And excuse, please, my pronunciation. And these studies were conducted in the census tracts that were closest to Midwest sterilization. And it's something that my community had um, asked for because of what we were reading, that uh, the, the increase in the cancer risks, the, the usage, the high usage of ethylene oxide, and also because of um, a TCEQ complaint that found that Midwest sterilization in the past had let one of their monitors, their sensors, um, operate inefficiently or um, that it wasn't in operation, I should say, and that wasn't corrected um, for at least four years. 
So I want to see strong standards for sterilization plants. I want to see them held to the strongest standards, and I want to see fence line air monitoring so that we don't have to depend on what they're reporting alone, that the community can know that the measures that they put in place are actually working and that their sensors keep working. The TCEQ is will allow, because Texas is that state, TCEQ will allow their leak alarms to operate at 1,500 parts per million of ethylene oxide when, we, when EPA has told us that danger is at 11 parts per billion. So I, I, I plead with you to please Ask, force these companies to have fence line air monitoring so that we don't have to trust their data, that we know it's objective data that can protect our communities. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your testimony. Any questions from the panel? Matt, Jonathan? You mentioned a number of studies, and it would be wonderful if you could um, provide those as part of the record for this rulemaking as well in your written comments. I, I certainly will. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. We are um, about 12 minutes away from a break. I'm wondering if there's anyone who would like to, to testify now. I'm going to look for folks if you would like to raise your hand. And I'm going to ask the logistics team to make sure that the chat includes the link to um, how to comment and also the registration link for um, the public hearing, the, the registration for the, the sessions this afternoon and then also tomorrow. And then again, as I started to say earlier, um, there is a walk-in session that's going to be on starting at 11 o'clock uh, on Thursday. And we would encourage folks to join us on that Zoom link if you would like to just to, to uh, participate that way. It is first come, first serve. So if you'd like to have a better sense of when you will be, be testifying, I would strongly encourage you to register for either a session later today or tomorrow, Wednesday. But if um, your schedule doesn't work for, month, for um, those times, please uh, feel free to come between 11 and 11 a.m. Eastern and 2 p.m. Eastern and we will be um, taking first come first serve um, testimony at that time. And again, please make sure that you, um, if you, even if you've testified today, we welcome your comments in writing. And I see that that um, information is uh, posted to everyone in the chat. And also if you would like to um, email us, the, what, the email for, um, the, is a good way to get us is eto at epa. Gov. So I'm going to have one more call for this session. Um, anyone who is interested in testifying at this time, just please raise your hand. I'm clicking through the names. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. So with that, I am going to um, uh, adjourn for um, or, uh, this close out this session. Um, and at this time, there are no registered speakers for this session. I wanna thank my fellow panelists and everyone who offered testimony today and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce, uh, reduce ethylene oxide emissions from commercial sterilizers, sterilization facilities under the Clean Air Act. And reminder, you can uh, submit written comments on this proposal through June 12th. And the next session will begin at 1.30. And um, again, if you are watching us on YouTube and you would like to testify or you're having any sort of technical problems, we absolutely want to hear about that. And please email us at eto at epa.gov. And with that, we will close this session and look forward to seeing people back at 1.30. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome to the EPA's public hearing on the ethylene oxide sterilizer proposal. First of all, I would like to say that we are providing Spanish interpretation for today's, today's meeting. To listen to either in Spanish or English, everyone will need to select the language at the bottom of your screen. So if you wouldn't mind going down to the bottom of your screen, there's a globe and you can click on that on the globe icon and select either English or Spanish. And with that, we will get going. Uh, again, good afternoon. My name is Kelly Reimer. I'm a group leader in the Office of Air and Radiation and the Air Toxics Assessment and Gr Group. And I will be chairing this virtual public meeting today. I'm glad you're all here. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to share your comments on EPA's proposal to, to reduce ethylene oxide emissions from commercial sterilizers. The proposal, which EPA announced on April 11th, would significantly strengthen and update Clean Air Act standards for ethylene oxide, also referred to as EO or ETO. And these emissions are come from the commercial sterilizing facilities, also called commercial sterilizers. The proposed rule is estimated to cut emissions of ethylene oxide from these facilities by 80% once the rule is implemented. Now I'd like to ask our EPA panelists to introduce themselves. In addition to myself, we have two panel members. Nick, you wanna go first? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Swanson. I am the acting group leader of the Policy and Strategies Group uh, in uh, Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And I'm happy to be here today. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Ned Shapley. I'm in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards and the Measurement Technology Group. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you both. Before we begin hearing from you, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to take care of today. First, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language or images, or a sustained disruption of the public hearing. We expect everyone participating in the hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on the panel to conduct ourselves with, a res with respect and in a civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event uh, to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note by registering this for this event, you have agreed to abide by the ground rules that I just went over. So here's how the, um, the hearing will work today. If you are registered to speak, you should have received an email notification that included the approximate time window when you were invited to speak. We'll do our best to stick to that, um, that window as close as possible. If you have joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open and the chat box is in the bottom of your screen. We will put the names of the next speakers in that chat box. We also may use that chat box to communicate directly with you during the hearing. So keep an eye on that chat box. When you see your name, you'll, you'll know you'll be called on soon. When, when, you're, when it is time, I will call on each speaker when it's your turn. And I'll do my best with name pronunciations, but I, I, I heartfeltly <laughs> apologize in advance for any mispronunciations that I may do. And, of course, feel free to correct me when, when I, if and when I get it wrong. Uh, when I call on you, you can unmute your line. And if you are joining via Zoom, that button is on the lower left of, you, left of your screen. If you are joining us by phone, you can unmute your line by hitting star six. You can toggle that, that toggles on and off. When you first come on screen, please, for the record, state your first and last name and spell it. That helps our court reporter get your name spelled correctly. And when you're providing testimony, you're welcome to activate your video camera by clicking start video. That's also in the lower left corner of your screen. Um, if you're not testifying, um, it would be great if you'd keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to comment. A four minute timer will appear on the screen and that will help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it's time to stop. If you have not stopped at four minutes, I'll step in and remind you that it's time to stop. 
If you are testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we are gonna strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items you would like to share, such as slide presentations or videos or studies or papers, you may submit them to the docket through the proposal for the docket for the proposal, excuse me, through June 12th, 2023. If you we are here to listen to you today, however, the panel members or I may ask um, clarifying comments, uh, clarifying questions when you speak. When you are finished speaking, please remain on the line until I am able to confirm that there are no further clarification questions from our panel. And then once we're done, please remute your remute your line and turn off your camera. Then I will call on the next speaker. So that's generally how it goes. If time allows, we may be able to add additional speakers. If you didn't pre-register and are interested in speaking, please send a direct message to attendee support in that chat box that's at the bottom of your screen. Our logistics team will let you know if there are any slots available and they'll assist you with registering. Finally, today's hearing consists of three sessions. Uh, we had a morning session earlier. This is the afternoon session and there's gonna be an evening session starting at five. When there are no additional speakers, um, if that happens, we may close the session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. And we may also take short breaks as needed. Again, I'd like to express my thanks for you taking your time to share your comments on this important rule today. With that, we can get going. So I'm looking for my view. All right, so we have two. the first two speakers this morning will be Paul Hancock and Winthrop Thurlow. Let's start with Mr. Hancock or Dr. Hancock. Uh, hello, I'm, uh, I hope you can hear me well. We can. Uh, my, my name is Paul Hancock, H-A-N-C-O-C-K, uh, uh, and I live in Glens Falls, New York, uh, within three miles of the Sterogenics facility on 84 Park Road in Kingsbury. Uh, I'm going to make this uh, brief because I could go over four minutes so easily, uh, I, 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 would, <laughs> I wouldn't even notice. So, so thanks for allowing me to comment on the new proposed EPA re regulations on ethylene oxide. My remarks refer specifically to the sterogenics operation at 84 Park Road in Kingsbury, New York. Briefly, uh, the nearby community of Hudson Falls is an environmental justice community. Uh, as determined by EPA's own guidelines. Over 22% of the population is below the poverty line and the median family income is $56,000. There's also clear evidence that both Hudson's Falls, Kingsbury and Glens Falls are experiencing elevated incidences of cancer. Warren County where Glens Falls is located, for example, has the highest rate of multiple myeloma of any New York state county outside of the Bronx. And the census tract 706.01, closest to sterogenics, has the highest rate of both lymphoma and breast cancer in the county. The closest census tracts to sterogenics in Washington County, where Kingsbury is located, also have the highest incidence of cancer per capita in that county. We believe, as do some of these cancer victims, that sterogenics is a significant threat to neighboring communities. We were very disappointed to learn in the new EPA rigs that the agency had, was not recommending fence line monitoring. This is a direct contradiction to comments made by e EPA officials to us in the past. In February of 2022, the US EPA Region 2 Director of Air and Radiation wrote to us on EPA letterhead stating that with respect to conducting outdoor air quality monitoring of ETO, EPA is actively engaged in supporting air monitoring for ETO. We would like to know why that position has changed. Further, it should be noted that every significant improvement in the protection of residences uh, in near ETO emitting facilities, we believe has been attended by external air monitoring. We know the DEC in New York State is opposed to it. We hope this is not a concession to state officials. 
Furthermore, in a 2021 letter to the manager of the Kingsbury Sterogenics facility, Michael Friedhoff, EPA Administrator of the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, uh, uh, supporting, re supported requiring the facility to resume reporting to the TRI, which it had done in, uh, up to 2016. Previous, and this is a quote, previous TRI reports indicate that the facility has a history of releases of ethylene oxide and ethylene glycol. So to us, there is evidence that the Kingsbury Sterogenics firm has not been the most, most responsible corporate citizen. This is evidence uh, we believe that we cannot trust them to protect the community an argument again for fence line air monitoring. We have a lot of other issues, but, but this uh, to me is a critical uh, point, knowledge of what people are breathing in nearby communities, some of them just a third of a mile from that facility with high rates of uh, 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 local cancer, cancer cluster. Uh, so we're very concerned about it. We have a neighborhood organization that is uh, actively uh, working to learn more. So uh, thank you so much for allowing me to comment and I will uh, pass it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. I was would like to now ask if the Panelists have any clarifying questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Winthrop Thurlow. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Winthrop, W-I-N-T-H-R-O-P, Thurlow, T-H-U-R-L-O-W. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm the executive director of MedTech, the Trade Association for the Biomed Industry in New York State. We represent the state's life sciences industry as it relates to healthcare. Medical technology is a $5.3 billion industry in New York, accounting for nearly 20,000 jobs. Our state is the nation's fifth biggest medical technology center in terms of jobs, sixth biggest in payroll, and 10th biggest in revenue. Our medical device and diagnostics manufacturers drive significant economic value to our state, our local communities, and to our residents. More significantly, however, our members are pioneering the life-changing healthcare technologies and treatments relied upon by patients around the globe. While medical device sterilization accounts for only half of 1% of all commercial ETO use, it sterilizes half of all medical technology or nearly 20 billion devices in the United States each year. It is the only effective viable sterilization method for heat or moisture sensitive materials. As producers of life-saving and life-enhancing products, we understand the importance of protecting public health and we support reasonable regulations. Alas, ethylene oxide sterilization facilities are at capacity. As the FDA recognizes, Many medical devices simply cannot be sterilized by another method. If new P EPA regulations force sterilization facilities to close, patients could face treatment delays as sterile technology supplies such as pacemakers and surgical equipment fall short. We cannot allow this to happen. We urge the EPA to recognize the importance of ETO use to the medical device industry and to ensure that the final rules will not negatively impact its use in device sterilization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any clarifying questions from the panel? Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Thurlow. All right, we, our next speaker is Katare Kaleha. And again, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Can you see me? There we are. It's Kachira Kayeha. Thank you. <laughs> okay, get started here. 
Uh, so thank you. Hello, I'm Katira Calleja, Vice President of Technology and Regulatory Affairs at AdvaMed, the MedTech Association. AdvaMed is the largest association representing the companies creating and manufacturing life-saving, life-enhancing medical technology for patients nationwide and around the world. Our members create and manufacture the bandages, IV tubing, blood sample kits, surgical tools, heart valves, pacemakers, syringes, catheters, and much more serving patients in every healthcare setting. The MedTech industry is committed to protect and improve public health. Use of ETO for the sterilization of medical equipment has been and will continue to be safe and is subject to stringent regulations in place for ETO use and emissions. We have welcomed the issuance of an updated NASHAP rule and appreciate EPA's efforts in its development, and we place the highest priority for the safety of our communities, employees, and millions of the patients that we serve. Medical device sterilization is only a tiny fraction of commercial use of all ETO, representing only half of 1% of all commercial use, but the risk of a patient of a public health threat is real. If we are constrained in our ability to serve patients with a steady, timely supply of safe, effective, sterile medical technology that our healthcare system requires. ETO sterilization is crucial for preventing infection in patients undergoing surgical procedures and other medical treatments. The process is used to sterilize half or 20 billion of all medical devices in the US each year. As the EPA notes, ETO sterilizes an estimated 95% of all surgical kits, according to EPA, and it is the only effective, viable method for many surgical devices. Amid tremendous demand in the U.S. healthcare system for sterile technologies, ETO sterilization is at capacity. Taking even a handful of facilities offline briefly likely creates supply disruptions causing delays in patient care. A combination of factors and proposed rulemaking could cause these problems and should be carefully considered given the serious implications for U.S. public health. The implementation timeframe of only 18 months is too short compared to typically three years. The te technical requirements, the proposed mandates combined with the tight implementation timeline present serious challenges. There are requirements for technology that simply doesn't exist or is in limited supply. We continue to urge EPA to consider technology neutral solutions for U.S. healthcare to meet the updated standards. The proposals do not consider background levels of ETO. ETO is both a naturally occurring gas and the byproduct of common everyday items such as school buses, lawn mowers, and charcoal grills. This is why ETO levels have been cited at a state park nowhere near an ETO store sterilization facility. The EPA also uses a worst case scenario estimate and modeling of ETO's risk by its own estimation. The EPA states an elevated risk of continuous exposure over 70 years for 24 hours a day, a highly unlikely scenario that has the potential to create confusion. The timeliest issue is the comment period of 60 days, which is too brief for regulation of this magnitude. Of this magnitude, there are over a thousand pages of regulations and then thousand more pages supporting material that stakeholders must read, digest, and respond to. And implementing this proposed regulation concurrently with a wide-ranging proposal regulating the registration of ETO compounds implementation challenges. Because of these concerns, the medtech industry is seeking an additional 60 days for public comment for 120 days total, consideration of a technology and neutral approach for both proposals, an examination of the existing background ETO levels, and EPA recognition of the supply chain disruptions that could cause a public health crisis if left unchecked. We'll be commenting on the proposed regulations and we're providing detailed feedback. We appreciate our longstanding collaboration with EPA, FDA, and government, other government agencies on policies that help us supply the American people with the most innovative med technology in the world while protecting community members and employees. We seek to prevent any delays in life enhancing, life sustaining patient care by working with the EPA to prevent supply shortfalls. Getting these regulations is right is critical to ensuring the availability of the medical technology that American patients rely on and deserve. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Any clarifying questions, Nick or Ned? No, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder, I would like to re remind folks to spell their names when they um, before they begin speaking. And also, because we have um, an interpreter with us, if folks could speak a little more slowly than their normal cadence, that would help the interpreter be able to, um, to translate. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Richard Truzpeck. And Mr. Truzpeck, you're on mute, I believe. I'll figure out technology eventually. It happens all uh, the time. <laughs> My name is Rich Trupek, last name is spelled T-R-Z-U-P-E-K. I'm a chemist and vice president of technical operations for Alliance Technical Group. 
I've been involved in air quality sampling and analysis for over 35 years. Rather than discussing any particular aspect of ethylene oxide re regulation under the NESHAP program, I'm using this opportunity to urge EPA to carefully consider three practical questions when conducting this residual risk analysis. These are, one, to what extent are emissions of ethylene oxide more or less important than emissions of other pollutants in terms of acute health risks? Two, how well understood and identified are ethylene oxide emissions from mobile and biogenic sources? And three, how do the reported mass emission rates of ethylene oxide nationwide and at the local level compare to mass emission rates of other hazardous air pollutants? Emissions of ethylene oxide should, of course, be carefully controlled and regulated. That issue is not in dispute. What is troubling to me is the extraordinary scrutiny this one hazardous air pollutant seems to have attracted over the last few years. It is true that ethylene oxide is listed as a hazardous air pollutant. So are 187 other air pollutants. It is true that ethylene oxide is used in significant quantities, but there are many other hazardous air pollutants that are used in much greater quantities at many more locations throughout the country. It is true that like any substance, if one, no, is, exposed to oxide, does, yeah, well, it, if one is exposed to ethylene oxide, if one is exposed to ethylene oxide, it can present a new I'm sorry, but your translator is coming over on my- Yeah, I think so. I think our, our tech folks are working on that. Um, please continue. I'll give you a little more time if you need it. Okay, thank you. It is true that like any substance, if one of it is over exposed to ethylene oxide, it can present an immediate acute health risk. Maybe another pause. Um, and Jake, um, folks, make an indication you all are working on that. Yes, Kelly, we are working on that. Just one moment, please, everyone. So sorry. I'm glad I'm not the only one with problems with technology. <laughs> Works until it doesn't. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, it is true that, like any substance, it's if one is overexposed, you know, overexposed, not quite. Not quite. Thanks for being flexible. No problem. <laughs> it's hard keeping up with with all of the changing technologies for sure. They're working on it. I'm getting notes. Probably not going to finish in 30 seconds. <laughs> no, no. I think I think we can restart your time. I, I, you shouldn't be punished for for uh, for a technical issue. Yeah. No. Go ahead. I'm not sure if this would help, but I'm not seeing the translate option at the bottom anymore. So I wonder if that oh. function somehow got turned off and the translator is just speaking on the same line. No, it's not there. It's not there. I don't have the channel. Okay, folks, thank you so much. Hold tight. Uh, we will have this resolved quickly. All right, at this time, uh, while we're working on the technical issues, uh, we will take a, a five minute break.
Um, if anybody has questions about today's hearing, we can um, you can send a direct message to attendee support if you'd like to register um, if you have not already registered. And with that, we will take a five minute break, which will put us back right at 2 p.m. Thank you, everybody.
Welcome back, everyone. I think we are in good shape now. As a reminder, my name is Kelly Reimer. I'm a group leader in, of the Air Toxics Assessment Group in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standings, and I'm the uh, chair today for the meeting. As a reminder, um, we are providing Spanish translation. I think everyone's aware of that. Uh, to listen to that, please go to the bottom of your screen and click on the icon that's the globe, and then you can select either English or Spanish. Um, again, I want to remind everyone today that the hearing is being recorded, um, and there will be a transcript. We will add that transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking, and of course, we will carefully consider everybody's comments um, on the final rule as we develop the final rule. Again, if you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, you can send a direct message in the chat to attendee support. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and our logistics team will add you to today's agenda um, if there are any spots. And I, I believe there are some spots later. Uh, please note by registering the, this event, you have agreed to abide by the ground rules, uh, the rules of behavior that I went over before. As a quick reminder um, about providing testimony, again, please unmute your line and you can feel free to come on camera by pressing start. All right, with that, if Mr. Trispak is ready, if you wouldn't mind, would you take it from the top and, and, and begin again? That way you'll get your four full minutes and the transcript will be un un uninterrupted. Is that okay? Right. Thank you. And again, thank you for your patience. No problem. My name is Rich Trupak, T-R-Z-U-P-E-K. I'm a chemist and vice president of technical operations for Alliance Technical Group. I've been involved in air quality sampling and analysis for over 35 years. Rather than discussing any particular aspect of ethylene oxide regulation under the NESHAP program, I'm using this opportunity to urge EPA to carefully consider three practical questions when conducting this residual risk analysis. These are one, to what extent are emissions of ethylene oxide more or less important than emissions of other pollutants in terms of acute health risks? Two, how well understood and quantified are ethylene emissions ethylene oxide emissions from mobile and biogenic sources, and three, how do the reported mass emission rates of ethylene oxide compare to mass emission rates of other hazardous air pollutants? Emissions of ethylene oxide should, of course, be carefully con controlled and regulated. That issue is not in dispute. What is troubling to me is the extraordinary scrutiny this one hazardous air pollutant seems to have attracted over the last few years. It is true that ethylene oxide is listed as a hazardous air pollutant, so are 187 other air pollutants. It is true that ethylene oxide is used in significant quantities, but there are many hazardous air pollutants that are used in much greater quantities at many more locations throughout the country. It is true that, like any substance, if one is overexposed to ethylene oxide, it can pre present an immediate acute health risk. Comparing health risks is at best accomplished using data provided by NIOSH, Specifically, NIOSH publishes concentrations which, if exceeded, are deemed to be immediately dangerous to life and health, or IDLH, for hundreds of compounds. The published IDLH value for ethylene oxide is 800 parts per million by volume, or PPMV. Contrast this with the IDLH values for other common substances, ammonia, 300 PPMV, hydrochloric acid, 50 PPMV, hydrogen peroxide, 75, and nitric oxide, a common byproduct of combustion, 100. Well, I'm sure that many people at EPA are aware that ethylene oxide is not an especially dangerous acute hazard. I believe most of the public has a different and more frightening perception of this chemical. Since ethylene oxide has been identified as a suspected human carcinogen, it is chronic health risk that is of greatest concern. Chronic exposure is, in turn, primarily important to people who work at the facilities where ethylene oxide is used or produced. This is analogous to concerns over exposure to benzene, another half that is a confirmed human carcinogen. Motorists may be exposed to minute concentrations of benzene when filling up at a gas station, but those exposures are so infrequent and transitory, they do not constitute a substantial public health risk, particularly when faced with the daily and far more lengthy personal potential exposures that uh, workers in the petrochemical 
sector could face. In my personal experience, facilities that use or produce ethylene oxide are very much aware of the potential chronic risks associated with the chemical. This is typical of industries handling materials that could present a chronic risk to workers, whether that risk is associated with potential carcinogens, radiation, or other materials. In these plants, many of which I have worked out throughout my career, management invariably goes to great pains to minimize and monitor worker exposure. Facilities handling ethylene oxide are no different. They bend over backward to protect their employees. Personal monitors, area monitors, testing programs, et cetera, are common at these facilities. This is an important point to consider when evaluating ethylene oxide use of any sort. Just as a neighbor who maintains a clean home is unlikely to dump trash in your backyard, an industry that's predisposed to minimize exposures within plant boundaries is unlikely to generate significant exposures across the fence line. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Any questions from the panel? Great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. John Conrad. Hi, my name is John Conrad. It's spelled J-O-H-N-C-O-N-R-A-D. I'm the president and CEO of the Illinois Biotechnology Innovation Organization, also known as iBio. We're the trade association that represents the 12,000 direct jobs in the medical device industry in Illinois. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to comment today. First, we're fully supportive of updating the rule that governs emissions of ethylene oxide sterilization plants. We've already done this in Illinois. Americans are admitted to the hospital 33.4 million times and visit doctor's offices a billion times per year. This care requires billions of pieces of sterile medical equipment manufactured by our members which includes sir, uh, syringes, catheters, surgical tools, heart valves, pacemakers, and other innovative life-saving technology. Ethylene oxide's 80 years of proven effectiveness means this method of sterilization uh, sterilizes approximately 50% of all medical devices. The use of ethylene oxide by our member companies is not their choice. It is selected because it's the only method that works for that device. The FDA reviews sterility assurance in approving the medical device. And according to the FDA, other me methods of sterilization cannot currently replace the use of ethylene oxide for many devices. Ethylene oxide sterilization is highly specialized function and sterilization facilities vary in their exact process to ensure sterility. This means that even if a company needed to switch to another facility, they would need to ensure that the, the facility they're switching to runs a similar process to the original facility We've had some of our member companies face this challenge in Illinois, and the delay was 100 days uh, for their medical device to get sterilized. Current sterilization facilities are at or very near capacity, so even a small disruption of few facilities will have meaningful effects on the industry and patient access to healthcare. Because of this, we have a few concerns. The EPA's proposed regulation is being put forward with a very short comment period. We've already heard about this um, to try to digest and respond to over 1,000 pages of rules. So we do support the additional 60 day extension. The longer comment period will help ensure sufficient time to review and comprehensively comment on a rule impacting patient access to critical medical technology by toxicologists, healthcare providers, medical technology companies, sterilizers, and patients. Also the EPA's proposed regulation is, is being put forward on a very short implementation timeframe. The implementation timeframe of 18 months is not possible. Supply chain issues and availability of materials is already a challenge um, and in some cases, this technology required may not even be available or accessible for the sterilization facilities. As each sterilization facility is different to support implementation, the EPA should embrace technology neutral solutions to meet new emission targets. That's multiple technologies could be necessary to achieve regulatory goals. And the methods that are too prescriptive might foreclose options that would keep facilities open and operating safely while serving American patients nationwide. We hope the EPA takes our comments into account and work with us to finalize regulations that ensure continued infection control while achieving the goal, which we all share of protecting community members and employees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Conrad. Questions? All right, thank you, sir. The next speaker that we've got is Kelvin Cullimore. I am trying to turn on my video, but it says I am blocked. Yeah. Okay, there we go. 
I started it too early. Apologies. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. All right, my, my name is Kelvin Cullimore, K-E-L-V-Y-N-C-U-L-L-I-M-O-R-E. -E. I'm the president and CEO of BioUtah. BioUtah is an independent 501c6 trade association serving Utah's life sciences industry, which includes medical device manufacturing, diagnostics, biotechnology, and biopharmaceuticals. BioUtah takes concerns regarding ETO emissions seriously. We are committed to working with the EPA, FDA, and all stakeholders to ensure a safe ETO sterilization process that protects public health. But that process must not disrupt the supply of life-enhancing and life-saving medical devices that patients and physicians rely on every day. Utah is the eighth largest med tech center in the country, supporting nearly 16,000 jobs, generating six billion in GDP. From heart valves and advanced stroke technologies to cancer diagnosis, knee replacement joints, complex imaging equipment, and more, Utah's medical device industry drives significant economic value while playing a critical role in improving health outcomes. Any medical device implanted in or used on a patient must be sterile to prevent serious infectious disease. And although medical device sterilization accounts for less than 1% of ETO usage in the US, ETO is the only effective sterilization method for more than 50% of all medical devices. One Utah company that would be subject to the proposed rule manufactures vascular products that can only be sterilized using ETO. The company deploys the best available ETO emission control technology in the industry, achieving greater than 99.95% destruction of the gas well beyond what is presently required under the Clean Air Act. They recently completed 15 million in state-of-the-art upgrades to post-sterile capture and control technologies as they endeavor to develop sterilization cycles that even use less ETO. Just one example of how the industry is forward-looking. Until alternatives to ETO can be identified and thoroughly tested, according to the FDA, other methods of sterilization cannot currently replace the use of ETO for many devices. Responsible and innovative changes will take years. Government will need to be, find a reasonable regulatory framework that protects the public while allowing manufacturers to meet FDA-required sterility levels. To that end, we are concerned that the proposed rules overly prescriptive methods and expedited timeline for implementation could be cost prohibitive and make it difficult for sterilization operations to remain open. Based on our Utah experience, the EPA is significantly underestimating compliance costs. If every facility in the U.S. invested 15 million, as they did here in Utah, in engineering controls, costs would exceed $1 billion. We urge the agency to embrace technology neutral solutions to meet any new emissions targets. Because ETO sterilization is already at capacity, closure of even a few sterilization facilities could cause supply shortfalls. This would have grave consequences for patients and could create a dire health crisis that the proposed rule fails to contemplate. In closing, we are concerned that the proposed rule amounts to an outsized response to the EPA's cancer risk projections based on highly conservative modeling especially given the lack of alternatives to ETO and the presence of the gas in ambient air. We hope the EPA and urge the EPA to take a measured and collaborative approach in working with industry and the FDA to develop reasonable and feasible solutions that maintain access to safe medical devices while safeguarding our employees and communities. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nick or Ned, any comments, questions? No, um, no questions. Thank you for your thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker would be Richard Reese or Rice, perhaps. Reese R R E I S S. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Rick Reese R I C K R E I S S. I'm a group vice president and principal scientist at Exponent, a scientific consulting firm. I'm speaking on behalf of the Ethylene Oxide Task Force today. EOTF is an ethylene oxide industry task force formed to address testing and data needs identified by the US EPA re-registration review of ethylene oxide under FIFRA. Some of the news following the release of the EPA risk assessments was alarming. It is alleged that ethylene oxide is a potent carcinogen and may be causing significant risk to workers and those living near sterilization facilities. However, a careful look at the evidence paints a different story. EPA based its cancer potency estimate on an epidemiologic study by the national, done by the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety, or NIOSH. The NIOSH study looked at cancer mortality in a cohort of workers in the sterilization industry and followed them after employment to see if they developed cancer. 
They also compiled rates of cancer in the general population to compare to the workers. The study concluded that there was, quote, little evidence of excess cancer mortality for the cohort as a whole. Thus, the sterilizer workers in the studies did not have clearly higher cancer rates than the general population. EPA conducted a complex dose response analysis of the NIOSH study and found, despite little difference in overall cancer rates between the workers and the general population, a significant cancer potency for several cancer subtypes. Using this potency estimate, EPA calculates a high cancer risk for sterilizer workers. However, analyzing the same, same data set, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ, found about a 2,000-fold fold lower potency. The differences in how EPA and TCEQ calculated its respective cancer potencies is complex and cannot be done justice in this form. However, as I will detail, many lines of evidence support a cancer potency closer to TCEQ than EPA. First, there is another significant epidemiologic study. This one was for manufacturing workers at Union Carbide Corporation. The UCC study, while smaller than NIOSH, had higher exposures to ethylene oxide. The UCC study was published in 2019 and concluded that, quote, no indications were found for, for excess cancer risk for, from ETO ex, EO exposures. Another line of evidence that is inconsistent with the higher cancer potency of ethylene oxide is that ethylene oxide is a significant, significant component of cigarettes. It is well known that smoking causes lung cancer and other, other cancer types. However, smoking is not associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the most significant cancer subtype driving EPA's potency estimate. The lack of an association between smoking and NHL is confirmed by IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and in other review articles in the literature. And this is inconsistent with EPA's potency estimate. Further, ethylene oxide is formed in the human body. This is called endogenous formation. Endogenous formation includes processes such as bacterial production in the gastrointestinal tract or systemic formation in the liver. Ethylene oxide is also formed in the body from other sources such as the ripening of fruit and vegetables. Several peer reviewed publications have documented this and these levels greatly exceed the levels uh, that residents near sterilization facilities may be exposed. So it's implausible that a chemical would be a potent carcinogen at levels that the body produces through natural processes. Another point is that there are significant background levels of ethylene oxide in the atmosphere that are not due to sterilization facilities. And there have been extensive air quality ca measurement campaigns to, to investigate this over the last several years. In many cases, the levels of ethylene oxide far away from sterilizer facilities is similar to the levels near sterilizer facilities. The source of this background is unclear, but needs to be further clarified. In summary, there are many lines of evidence that cast doubt on EPA's conclusion that ethylene oxide has a high cancer potency, and others, including the state of Texas, have come to substantially different conclusions using the same information. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Doctor. At this time, I would like to uh, remind folks um, to try to speak a little more slowly than your normal cadence. Um, that helps the interpreters be able to um, translate better. Thanks. Our next speaker is Stephanie Heron. Hello, you can hear me? Yes. Wonderful. I am a fast talker, but I appreciate our interpreters. Thank you, and I will attempt to speak slowly. Um, my name is Stephanie Heron, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-H-E-R-R-O-N. I am the organizer with the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, or EJHA. EJHA is a national network of environmental and economic justice organizations that support a just transition to safer chemicals and a pollution-free economy that leaves no worker or community behind. Our affiliates are located throughout the country, and one thing that they all have in common is a deep love for their communities and their families, just about all of whom have been and continue to be disproportionately harmed by toxic pollution. Three of the commercial sterilizers covered by this rule are located in EJHA affiliate communities, including Lake County, Illinois, Houston, Texas, and Los Angeles. We additionally have affiliates located in a number of communities that have been or are currently harmed by the production of ethylene oxide. EJHA is a network in strategic partnership with Coming Clean, 
And we are together guided by the vision of a safe and healthy environment outlined in the Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals and recommend EPA look to this document and the accompanying policy papers for guidance in developing this and other rules to achieve the agency's mission. I'm here on behalf of EJHA, our network, and also standing in solidarity with communities around the country who have been and are being harmed by ethylene oxide from sterilizers and other sources. As others have mentioned, a recent report from the Union of Concerned Scientists found unsurprisingly that air toxics cancer risk from commercial sterilizers were disproportionately impacting people of color, low-income people, and people with limited English proficiency or who speak another language primarily. This isn't shocking to us at EJHA because this country has a long history of environmental racism, particularly due to the language and linguistic isolation. It's critical that language justice is prioritized in this rule and other rules, and that communications and alerts related to ethylene oxide sterilizers and other facilities are made available in multiple languages. First off, I wanna say EPA really needs to move away from the paradigm of acceptable risk. The only acceptable risk of cancer and other devastating health harms to communities is zero. Further, communities don't experience the risk from ethylene oxide from sterilizers in a vacuum. In many communities that have a sterilizer, it's not the only source of ethylene oxide, let alone the only source of toxic air pollution. Our bodies don't have the option to only inhale or process one pollutant from one facility at a time, and EPA shouldn't regulate air pollution like they do. Looking at cancer and other health risk in this siloed way downplays the real danger in communities and um, needs to be addressed. I'm gonna skip some because I see that I only have one minute left. <laughs> Uh, we strongly support EPA's decision to continue relying on the best available science using the 2016 IRIS risk assessment to set emission standards. We're appreciative of the fact that EPA is taking a number of actions to address ethylene oxide and other harmful air pollution. We're glad that EPA is taking steps in this rule to include previously excluded process, but believe the rule needs to be expand or improved in a number of ways including requiring safer alternatives for ethylene oxide whenever possible, requiring fence line monitoring with corrective action at all facilities releasing ethylene oxide and other known hazardous air pollutants, including commercial sterilizers. And third, the rule must be expanded to cover offsite warehouses where sterilized equipment is being sent for storage and off-gassing. Many companies transport medical equipment to warehouses that are not subject to any Clean Air Act regulations at all. Thank you for your comments. Sorry, it's time to wrap it up. And and please, uh, if you would submit your whole set of comments to the docket, that would be terrific. Thank you. I'm seeing if we've got more folks on deck right now. If you have questions about the hearing today. Um, or if you're interested in registering to speak, you can send a, a message to attendee support in the chat box. And then again, that chat box is in the bottom of your screen. Uh, you also may you may raise your hand using the hand raise icon at the bottom, and our technical staff um, will will um, will uh, set you up for that. Uh, right now, we'll continue with our speakers. We've got. Uh, and I apologize for the name again, Solera Hughes. And, and obviously, please correct me. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Solera Hughes, C-E-L-E-R-A-H-H-E-W-E-S. I'm a national field manager for Moms Clean Air Force and an organization with over one and a half million parents, caregivers, and family members working to protect children's health from the impacts of climate change and air pollution. And I live with my family in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm here today to urge the EPA to pass strong emission standards for commercial ethylene oxide sterilization facilities and fumigation operations. 
According to the Food and Drug Administration, more than 20 billion medical devices sold in the United States every year are sterilized with ethylene oxide, accounting for approximately 50% of devices that require sterilization. While sterile medical devices are important for the health of our communities, it is also important that commercial sterilization facilities be held accountable for the health impacts of ethylene oxide emissions, a hazardous air pollutant. Air pollution and toxic chemicals propose a disproportionate risk to pregnant women and children. All too often, families living close to industrial facilities are also disproportionately communities of color or low wealth. All children have the right to breathe clean air, and we ask that EPA protect the health of our families and communities from this toxic air pollutant. Ethylene oxide, referred to as ETO, is a known carcinogen, classified as such by the Department of Health and Human Services and the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Exposure to ETO increases the risk of lymphoid cancer, as well as breast cancer in women. ETO exposure may also impact fertility, and because it causes chromosome damage, children are, are particularly susceptible to health impacts. Other health impacts of chronic exposure to ETO include irritation of the eyes, skin, nose, throat, and lungs, and damage to the brain and nervous system. This rule should do a few things to better protect communities. First, all sterilization facilities across the country must be required to use air pollution control technologies, practices, and procedures which have been demonstrated to reduce ethylene oxide emissions from these commercial sterilization facilities. Second, given how toxic ethylene oxide is to humans, continuous air pollution monitoring at the facility must be required to ensure that pollution control equipment is operating effectively. This data must also be shared with the community and reported to EPA frequently. Third, real-time fence line air monitoring around the perimeter of the facility along with community website access to data should be required to help protect the surrounding community. And finally, there must be no pollution loopholes. The EPA must close loopholes that exempt commercial sterilization facilities from certain Clean Air Act regulations during startup, shutdown, and malfunction events. For families living near the facilities, the cumulative impacts of pollution releases during these startup, shutdown, and malfunction events increase the risk of cancer and other health issues. It is unconscionable to allow families to be exposed to high risks of cancer when the EPA can take action. Again, for the health of our families and communities exposed to ETO, EPA must work swiftly on this proposal to significantly strengthen and update standards that would reduce toxic ethylene oxide emissions by 80% from commercial sterilization facilities across the country and protect human health. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your comments. Any clarifying questions? Great. Uh, our next speaker is Michelle Roberts. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Roberts. I'm the National Co-Coordinator for the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, better known as EJHA. I'm going to expedite my time because you heard from many of my colleagues and recently heard from Stephanie Heron, who, who gave an overarching background of who we are, um, EJHA, as, as community-led and uh, we, excuse me, take a step back, we uh, actually are standing in solidarity with the many communities and workers across this nation and in our network and our strategic partnership with that of the Coming Clean Network um, to make sure and assure the fact that we uphold the dignity rights of all communities and workers by number one, um, notifying the fact that there is no acceptable cancer risk. None of our communities, not one, not one community member nor worker should be uh, permitted to be allowed acceptable cancer risk. That is a fundamental human right. Um, 
we equally uh, stand with the fact that sterilizers are only one type of the facility contributing to the health harming pollution in our communities. Many of our communities, as we know of, are environmental justice communities harmed by and that of environmental racism, as you heard from Stephanie Heron, with legacy challenges of not just the ethylene oxide um, uh, situation, but that of failed government uh, failed government protections, if you will. So therefore, this we must make sure that um, this is really emphasize as a cumulative impact effect on our communities and that there should not be any permiss permissible hazards placed on them any further than what they've already have experienced. Therefore, we should be eliminating these harms as opposed to adding to the harms. We must have the most stringent emissions regulations possible. We stand with that of our colleagues, uh, Dario Manova of the, and Celeste Flores, who spoke earlier as well, um, and our friends from the Union of Concerned Scientists. The proposed rules should be expanded to cover other processes as well, fence line monitoring, offsite warehouses, and research and development sources should be at uh, also required in this rule. We should also make sure that we emphasize that we need to wear and prioritize the need for safer chemicals and a safer process to addressing these hazards. And last, really protecting the fact that our community, our dignity rights of our communities, that they should not be allowed to be permitted additional harm, additional pollution, if anything, they should be prioritized for remedy, redress, cleanup, and protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Ned or Nick, any clarifying questions? Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Our next speaker, I believe we've got Yolanda Cooper Sutton. Mm -hmm. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you today? Doing well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I won't be long before you because I think the persons that have gone before me have spoke very eloquently and have voiced a lot of concerns. And what I really wanted to say is we really have to be very um, aware of what this chemical is doing uh, to our communities of color. We really stress the need of not waiting until the last minute. This has been going on for, for decades, for centuries, putting sterilization, putting factories and putting um, um, companies like these in our color communities and causing harm to us. And we need to be very cognizant of what is happening around us. Um, it's, it's, it's a sad day that we're still fighting uh, here uh, like this. It's, it's a sad day that we're in 2023, still asking and still uh, really um, trying to um, put safer be safer, make it safer for our communities and, you know, and making safer chemicals, especially when you, you plant them in, uh, in the communities of color. And um, we see the data, we see the research and we know the outcomes of what has happened in, in the past and then still happening in the near future. So um, I, I concur with what has been said thus far in regards to our children um, having to live in this type of environment, this type of pollution. So um, please, please, as we are uh, talking and as you are listening to us to take in great consideration that you know our lives are important and we want to live and have long jeopardy just as well as anyone else does. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm waiting to see if 
we've got somebody else on deck. And a reminder, if you are, if you have questions about the hearing today, you can put a chat in the attendee support in the chat box. Also, if you want, you can reach out to us with any questions using our ethylene oxide inbox at ethylene oxide at ETO at EPA.gov. Uh, that's not the official record for the hearing, but what we do with that website, um, with that inbox is we, um, we answer folks' questions. Um, so if you've got a question that you'd like to ask, feel free to, um, to put that in there. If anybody uh, would like to uh, register, we could do, if anybody's on, would like to do a hand by hand raising, the, our crack technical staff can uh, put you in uh, to get you registered real quick. And if you are calling in, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And if you're in the room, do you believe we've got one hand? So David Marsh, I believe. Are we good to have David testify? All right, I'm waiting to see if Mr. Marsh can testify. Great, Mr. Marsh, if you can take yourself off of mute and put on your video. Can you hear me? We can, welcome. Thank you, my name is David Marsh, D-A-V-I-D-M-A-R-S-H. I'll try to speak slowly enough for the interpreters and thank you to all of you. I'd like to address two issues. One is the timeline. I went to work for Sterigenics Corporation. I was hired as their corporate maintenance engineer. EO engineer was my official title in June of 2012. Their corporate engineering staff that I worked with handed me a stack of cancer maps by July of 2012. They asked me to go into their plants, audit the plants and find out, I believe their words, exact words were, what kind of stuff we're leaking, if we are, or what we're being blamed for leaking. Um, I'm gonna refrain from exact name. I went into these plants, including Illinois, Carolina, Smyrna, Georgia, Kingsbury, New York, Santa Teresa, and others, probably. I walked into their leaks to label them, to try to get them fixed. We fixed Texas because they had a good maintenance team. When we fixed Texas, and I, I put my nose in these leaks, it took two months for me to show definite cognitive decline, bones that hurt from the inside out. Six months I was diagnosed with leukemia, it was just before New Year's of 2013. Nobody wanted to work New Year's to go supervise a welding job in Santa Teresa. So they sent me after I told them I was diagnosed with leukemia. When I came back from Santa Teresa, I went into the corporate office, told the HR, I guess you heard I have leukemia. Her exact words to me were, yes, I know. And I have to fire you for it now. Here's the thing about the timeline. I had those cancer maps in 2012. How much time, more time do they think they need? And why has it been covered up since I had those maps, discussed them with plant managers and maintenance managers, and took the hit of their cancer, had them throw me away like a used lab rat. When I went for that entrance physical, they took excessive amounts of vials of blood 
the phlebotomist uh, commented on it. The clinic was in Burns Harbor, Indiana, my hometown. For some reason, when I got some of the stuff I asked for, when I found out all of, about all this in 2019-20, and just by Googling their name and seeing the nightmare that began with, that was now titled Cancer Maps, Sterogenics Cancer Maps, the ones that I realized I'd had 10 years ago and could have started this fight then. They've had plenty of time. These monitors should be on their fences. They should be tied to the internet or YouTube where we can see real time how they behave. Even though I've been through this, I'm still this chemicals advocate. I agree that this does the job, does it well. It'll be killing me for the rest of my life. It does its job well. We need this chemical. I will acknowledge that, but it can only be done if it's done at a stop line. And we say it's this much coming out of your stack and around your perimeters. And when you go over that line, you stop, you fix it and you start it back up. Nobody's telling anybody to endure shortages here. No one. We understand that this is a wicked problem and we need this chemical. And if you don't understand that, you don't under. But the background argument is the same model Philip Morris Corporation used in the last half of the 20th century. Find something you can use as an excuse, pay your executives high salaries, just tow your line, whisper in the ears of politicians, lie under oath that this does not cause cancer. All right. Um, I appreciate that. I very much appreciate your time. Um, I let you go a little bit over. Um, thank you very much for that. And I appreciate you all. Thank you for taking your time. We appreciate it. Any clarifying questions? Thank you. Thank you again. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're muted, Kelly. If folks are interested in speaking again, you can raise your hands. You can send a chat to uh, attendee support. If you're on the phone, you can do star nine. Also, again, we appreciate um, if anybody has papers or their written testimony they want to submit to the docket. Uh, we've got in the meeting chat the website for the docket and inf information on how to submit your comments. So you can do that. If you have a general question that you'd like EPA to answer about this action or ethylene oxide in general, uh, the inbox for that, the mailing address, the uh, web address is eto at EPA dot g o v e t o at e p a dot g o v and we do our best to get to all those all those questions and you get an answer to your inbox all right i'll wait another couple of seconds to see if we've got anybody who's raising their hand all right if not uh, at this time, we will take a short recess. We'll take a 15-minute recess. Let's make it a 16-minute recess so that we come back right at 3 o'clock on the dot. Thank you very much. We'll see you in a few minutes.
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from the break. My name is Kelly Reimer, and I've been chairing this session. I want to thank. I would like to thank everybody who shared comments so far on today's proposed action. If you've got questions today about the hearing, or if you're interested in registering to speak, you can send a direct message to the attendee support in the chat box. If And the chat box is at the bottom of your screen. If you are on the phone, you can press star nine and the technical staff will let you in and set you up so that you can testify. As a reminder, we're providing Spanish interpretation for today's hearing. To listen either in English or Spanish, you will need to go to the bottom of your screen, click on the globe, and if you'd like to listen in Spanish, you click Spanish, and if you'd like to live, listen in English, you click English. And as a reminder to any uh, to the speakers this afternoon, if you could please speak a little more slowly than your normal voice, like I'm trying to do now, uh, because that helps the translator um, uh, do their do their translations. They can catch up with our voices and better. So thank you for that. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to reintroduce the panel. Reintroduce the panel. They'd like to reintroduce themselves at this moment. Ned. Uh, hi, uh, Ned Shapley in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards and the Measurement Technology Group. I'll pass it over to Nick. Nick Swanson. Uh, I'm in the Policies and Strategies Group, uh, Group Leader. And uh, Thank you. Thank you both. I want you to remind you today that the hearing is being recorded and transcribed. There will be a written transcript, and that transcript will be available in the docket. I'd also like to make sure that you understand that we will carefully consider your comments as we develop the final rule. Please note by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by ground rules for the virtual hearing, and that includes rules of behavior. EPA is committed to a mutual uh, a situation where there's mutual respect and safety. The agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language or images, or sustained disruption of this public hearing. EPA expects all participants, including panelists, registered speakers, and attendees to conduct themselves in a respectful, professional, and civil manner. And we will monitor this to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld throughout the hearing. A quick reminder, um, when you're providing testimony, I will call on you to speak. You would unmute your line and you can do that by clicking the button on the lower left part of your screen. You can also go, come on camera. Again, you can click that on the lower left part of your screen. Please state your name clearly for the record and spell it. Uh, everybody will have four minutes to speak. That timer will begin when, um, when the, uh, when you when you begin speaking your name and spelling your name for us. All right, with that, we had a couple of registered speakers. I wanna see if they are here yet. Amy Goodman, if Amy Goodman is on, you could raise your hand and logistics staff can let you in. All right. Let's see. Richard Manning, is there Richard Manning? I'm not seeing a Richard Manning. All right, any other folks here who would like to raise their hand and speak? You can just use the raise hand function. Again, you can put um, that request in the chat that you'd like to speak. Okay. Again, we also have the ethylene oxide inbox. If anybody has just a general question on the rulemaking, has a general question on ethylene oxide in general, we'll do our best to answer all those questions. That address is eto at epa.gov. That's E-T-O at 
epa.gov.gov. All right, so our two registered speakers aren't here. I'm not getting the indication that we have walk-ins that are prepared to speak at this moment. So what we'll do is take another 15 minute break. Uh, that will put us back, is it three or five? That'll put us back at 320. And we hope that our registered speakers will have arrived by then. So thank you, we will, we will the hearing will, will stand in recess until 320, thank you.
We'll resume the hearing in just a couple more minutes. Thanks for your patience. Good afternoon and welcome back from the break. My name is Kelly Reimer. I've been chairing the afternoon session of the hearing for EPA's proposal to reduce ethylene oxide from commercial sterilizer facilities. As a reminder, we're providing Spanish interpretation for today's hearing. To listen to the hearing either in Spanish or English, you can select a language. There's an icon at the bottom of your screen, a little globe. You can click on that, press English for English and Spanish for Spanish. A note to speakers, because we have a Spanish interpreter, it would be great if we could speak a little more slowly than our normal speaking cadence. And that allows the interpreter to do the translation um, a little easier. So that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, joining me on the panel again, um, I'd like to ask Ned and Nick to introduce themselves again. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, uh, I'm Ned Shapley in the Office of Air Quality Planning Standards and the Measurement Technology Group. Passing it over to Nick. Uh, Nick Swanson, Acting Group Leader for the Policies and Strategies Group in the Office of Air, Air Quality Planning and Standards. Thank you, gentlemen. 
I'd like to remind everybody today that the hearing is being recorded and transcribed, and there will be a written transcript of the hearing. That transcript will be added to the docket for this rulemaking, and we will carefully consider everybody's comments as we develop the final rule. The comments are a very important part of the process. If you have questions about today's hearing, or if you are not registered but are interested in speaking, you can send a direct message to attendee support, and you can send a, that note in, a, in the chat box. And again, the chat box is on the bottom of your screen and about the middle of your screen on the bottom. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Uh, our logistics team will add you to the agenda today if you'd like to do that. Uh, there's also the option of just raising your hand with a hand icon at the bottom of the screen. We can, we can get you in that way as well. Uh, please note that by registering and speaking at this event, you agree to abide by the ground rules of our virtual hearing, and that includes rules of behavior. Uh, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. Uh, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language or images, or a sustained disruption. Um, and EPA expects everybody participating, uh, panelists, registered speakers and attendees um, to abide by those rules and conduct ourselves in a respectful, professional and civil manner. Uh, we will monitor this uh, during, the, during the public hearing. A quick reminder about testimony. Uh, when I call on you, please speak. Um, uh, uh, speak your name, spell your name. And uh, in order to get on screen, you can click in the bottom left if you're on camera. Uh, you click the camera and the uh, the unmute in the bottom left of your screen. Uh, you will have four minutes to speak, and the four minutes begins when you introduce yourself. Now I'm seeing if we've got anybody else here to testify. We have two people. We've got Amy Goodman. Is Amy Goodman in the house? All right. I'm not hearing that. We've got Richard Manning. Is Richard Manning available? Okay, we're not seeing Richard Manning. Is there anybody else who has joined us who's not registered who would like to speak? Who would like to just raise their hand with the raise hand icon? or star nine if you're on the phone. Okay. And also I'd like to remind folks that there is a, an email box that we've got that we're collecting and answering questions to folks that if you have a question about the rule, a question about ethylene oxide in general, we will do our best to answer the question uh, and send an answer back to you via email. That email address is eto at epa.gov. All right. And and Jake, thank you. Let's just put that in the chat again. All right. I'd like to wait one more minute to see if we've got anybody who's going to walk on. If not, what we'll do is we will close this session and the evening session will, will begin at 5. So we'll just wait another another minute. All right. So as a final reminder, you can submit uh, your comments through June 12th, 2023. So the docket will be open through to the end of the day on June 12th. So feel free to, to submit your comments there. So at this time, we will take a recess. The next session will begin at 5 p.m. And I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance, their attention, and their testimony. Thank you very much.
Welcome. We are providing Spanish interpretation for today's hearing. To listen to the hearing in either English or Spanish, everyone will need to select a language at the bottom of your screen. Click on the globe icon, then select either English or Spanish. My name is Jody Howard. I am the group leader in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards, and I will be chairing this session of the virtual public hearing. Thank you for taking time out of your day to share your comments on EPA's proposal to reduce ethylene oxide emissions from commercial sterilization facilities. This proposal, which EPA announced on April 11, 2023, would significantly strengthen and update Clean Air Act standards for ethylene oxide, also referred to as ETO, which is emitted into the air from commercial sterilizing facilities also called commercial sterilizers. The proposed rule is estimated to cut emissions of ETO from these facilities by 80% when the rule is implemented. Now I'd like to ask our other EPA panelists to introduce themselves. On the panel are Barrett. Hi, I'm Barrett Parker. I'm with the Measurement Policy Group. I supported the rule rider with emissions measurement, monitoring, reporting, and testing requirements. Yes. Hi, my name is Tess Pettish. I work in the Air Economics Group, and I, um, I did the regulatory impact analysis for this rule. Thanks. Thank you. We are also joined today by a transcriptionist who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and will carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. Okay. Before we begin hearing from you, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to review to make today's hearing run smoothly. First, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on this panel to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note, by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. Okay, let's move on to how today's hearing will work. If you are a registered speaker, if you are registered to speak, you should have received an email notification that included an approximate time window when you will be invited to speak. We will do our best to stick as close to that time as possible. If you, has, if you have joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. We will put the names of the next speakers in the chat box. We will also use the chat to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call in each speaker when it's their turn. Let me apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. When I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. If you are joining us via Zoom, that button is on the lower left of your screen. If you are joining us by phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six. Please state your first and last name and spell it for the record. When you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you are not testifying, please keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to give comments. Our four minute timer will be displayed on the screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it's time to stop. If you are testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we are going to strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items that you would like to share, such as a slide presentation or videos, you, must, you may submit them to the docket for the proposal through June 12, 2023. We encourage you to also submit a written copy of the testimony you provide today. We will post information on how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the hearing. 
We are here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you are finished speaking, please remain on the line until I am able to confirm that there are no further clarifying questions from our panel. Once we are done, please remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. If time allows, we may be able to add additional speakers. If you did not pre-register and are interested in speaking, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. Our logistics team will let you know if there are any time slots available and will assist you with registering. Finally, today's hearing consists of three sessions, morning, afternoon, and evening. If there are no additional speakers, we may close the session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We may also take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time today to share your comment on EPA's proposal. Let's get started. So let me check. Okay, our first two speakers are Angela Johnson and Rose Sims. Remember when you begin to speak, State your first and last name and spell them for the record. Ms. Johnson. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Angela Johnson. First name is A-N-G-E-L-A. -E last name J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Um, I work with Memphis Community Against Pollution. Uh, we have recently done a lot of work closely with the Mallory Heights um, community, um, in specific the Mallory Heights um, Community Development Corporation. And today, of course, I'm standing here as a represent representative of the community to speak about our concerns regarding ethylene oxide. Um, this area known as Southwest Memphis, more specifically South Memphis in general, um, has a cumulative popul and pollution burden. Um, there, from not only the sterilization services of Tennessee, but of at least 19 other air polluted facilities in the area. And this has been taking place for many years, probably lately dating back to the 1960s. But in regards to the ethylene oxide issue in specific, um, I would like to address first uh, a faster implementation time. From my understanding, the, um, the EPA is looking at having facilities um, 18 months to make their changes. Uh, Memphis was notified of this problem in August of 2022. And so it, that means we've been for 50 years, we have been subjected to toxic chemicals at a rate, at rates up to 20 times the EPA's acceptable risk level from this facility. The EPA can require an implementation period as short as 90 days, and you should. This rule has been a long time coming and the EPA has is already 15 years late in reviewing the rule and seven years late in incorporating the iris risk assessment data into the new rule. Companies have had noticed that new requirements are coming and should need additional time for implementation. Um, the EPA has acknowledged many companies are moving voluntarily to reduce emissions already. Unfortunately for Memphis, the sterilization services of Tennessee has refused to take any voluntary actions. Communities have already waited so long for the EPA to act to reduce the pollution and having anything longer than the shortest implementation period allowed unnecessarily puts additional lives at risk. Um, next, I wanna to touch on reducing uh, fugitive emissions. Last year, when the EPA informed us that fugitive emissions were the cause for the excess of cancer rates in Memphis, uh, while the, this rule does not address fugitive emissions, we do fear that it does not go, go far enough. The rule does not have any measures to ensure that the enclosures meant to capture fugitive emissions are actually working. Instead, proposing that local regulators will set these comp um, compliance measures. The community has trust that the control measures were working before, and of course they weren't. So we need the assurance on a federal level. level. Tennessee legislators have consistently taken power and funding from environmental regulators here in Tennessee, of course. And locally, we have experienced to see our regulations overruled by state officials. So federal protections would ensure stronger protections. 
in regards, uh, I speak about directly the Bahia Pipeline fight in Memphis, where locally there are protections placed over to ensure that our water system, our, our aquifer was protected. But then on a state level, our local legislations were overruled. So we definitely need stronger federal protections that would keep our communities safe. Next, continuous emission monitoring. The rule does not require continuous emissions monitoring for all control devices. All levels of monitoring to demonstrate how much ETO is being released into the community are cr critical. For so long, the community has been left in the dark as to what, what is actually in the air that we're breathing. And in regards to community air monitoring, the proposed rule does not include any monitoring requirements that would give an image of how much ETO people in the community are actually breathing. The community wants and needs fence line monitoring to ensure that these new pollution control devices are working. In Memphis, the commercial sterilizer has not been receptive to community concerns. Further, the community has been told time and time again that the facility is allegedly in compliance with their permits, yet we are still at risk for cancer. Community Ms. Johnson. Yes. Your time has expired. So if oh. you could wrap your comments up. Actually, the first points were the major points that I really wanted to touch on. Um, and those were just extra ones if I had the time. So I yield the floor. Thank you. For okay. Your time. Um, I'll turn to my panelists. Do any of you have follow-up questions? Dr. Major. I don't. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, um, Rose Sims is our next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Rose Sims. It's R-O-S-E-S-I-M-S. -S -S. I'm a resident of Memphis, Tennessee. I've been in South Memphis majority all my life, but I've lived in the area since 1998. I am concerned. I know only yesterday when they had the uh, conference call, they stated that. Um, they knew about this since 2016 and that they had to take, uh, you know, uh, tests and everything to uh, to allow, I mean, to let us know about how much was being released in the air. Just like myself and others, 18 months is too long for us to be waiting. Right now, I don't even, I go outside to my car before it's cutting my yard, playing outside with my grandbaby or barbecuing or whatever, I'm not able to do that because guess what? I have health issues along with my other kids and it's other neighbors and it's other residents that have health issues. And the thing about it is there's, you know, the health department had a, a meeting stating that um, they did council research or whatever else. And they didn't see a lot of um, the to do the council studies from 2020, if I'm not not, mis not mistaken, I'm sorry, from 2000 to 2023, that they did not have a lot of, lot of results saying that the ETO can cause cancer, but it can cause cancer. I mean, we had people since last year, even at the meetings talking about residents on the street had cancer. And I've known several people had cancer. So, and it's not her, not all cancer, it's hereditary. So, for them to tell us that, I mean, it's a frightening situation. And I just really, really think that EPA can shorten that time period of 18 months. It shouldn't take 18 months. So you're telling me, EPA is telling us that, oh, okay, we got to stay in the house 18 months? Everybody over here cannot pick up and move. You got a lot of senior citizens as well as myself. I'm retired. We cannot pick up and move from the plant where the plane is located. So I'm asking you all, and I'm pleading with you all to let it be less than 18 months. Something needs to be done. And again, like I said, I cannot go outside due to my health issues. And that is not fair as a resident, and, uh, and, but you got several people outside now because they don't know of the danger of this ETO. And you, you, we should have thousands of people on this call, but a lot of people, I don't know if they're not concerned or, or they just don't know, but something needs to be done. Shelby County Health Department telling us that they can't do anything about it. EPA, you all need to do something about it. Whoever, please do something about it. I wanna enjoy my retirement. I wanna be able to go outside. 
Um, I'm right now, I'm afraid to be out there because of, again, health issues that I've already had and been through and uh, along with my children. So you all need to understand it. Uh, the ones who don't live in our community, no, you won't understand. But you got plants like that that are close to residence, uh, residential areas. Something needs to be done. And I've been on these calls. I've been in, been interviewed and everything saying the same thing. I would like for you all to do something about it. It is not fair that everybody want to take their time, but then we got to go out here and breathe this toxic air. So please, I'm asking you all again to do something about it. Somebody can do something. Don't let it be 18 months. Don't let it be three years Shut the company down now and let them get the new regulations in in less than 90 days, as Ms. Johnson just stated. Again, please, you all do something. I want to enjoy my life. My kids want to enjoy their life. My grandkids, every, these residents, we want to be outside. But we cannot due to the fact of them releasing that type of ETO in the, in the air. And they've been knowing this for a long time. It's just not been since 2016. This company been since 1970, 73 or whatever. And they knew the dangers. They knew the dangers that would happen in a residential community. Why, why have to be in a, at, at an area, excuse me, and I'm not racist. Don't get me wrong, I'm not. But why would it have to be in an area where Black people are living? And you know that the low-income people are living, know that we can't pick up and go to Cargillville. It ain't in Cargillville. You ain't got it in Germantown, Cordova, Arlington, Lakeland, no places like that. So why you all can't do anything about it? If you can't do anything about it, shut the company down, move it to the industrial area, and make it safe for us to be here. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Mr. Parker or, or, or Ms. Pettis, do you have any follow-up questions? No follow-ups from me. And none from me either, but thank you for your testimony. Okay. Our next two speakers are Brian Johnson and Abigail Trotter. Again, please state your first and last name and spell them as you begin your testimony. Good evening, my name is Brian Johnson, B-R-I-A-N-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Medical Device Industry Council. For 27 years, our organization has been the voice of the medical technology ecosystem in Massachusetts, which counts more than 420 companies and in excess of 20,000 direct employees in our Commonwealth. Our members represent the best of science and commerce, a constellation of mission-driven organizations designing, building, and commercializing everything from the next generation of robotic surgical systems to simple catheters. Three years ago, as the COVID-19 pandemic was ravaging our state, our companies donated PPE and other key medical supplies to hospitals and healthcare systems at the same time as they were scaling up to produce critical life-saving technologies, such as ventilators, ECMO machines, blood, and blood gas analyzers. Our employees worked double shifts in very uncertain times so that we could fight back the tsunami of COVID cases. If it weren't for these companies, our country and our world would be in a much different place right now. The pandemic revealed tremendous structural issues in our healthcare supply chain when the worst of the pandemic set upon us. Too often, our healthcare heroes and our most vulnerable patients were left without critical medical supplies. However, through sheer force of ingenuity, our system recovered for the most part. Still, COVID challenges have not receded. Our healthcare supply chain is plagued by bottlenecks, shortfalls, and challenges that are still impacting care in innumerable ways when we are just finally starting to get over the COVID crisis. I am here today because I fear that we are moving too fast with changing the rules around ethylene oxide for medical device sterilizations, and we may be purposely walking into yet another healthcare supply crisis. Ethylene oxide is one of the most common ways to sterilize medical technology. 50% of all medical devices, that's 20 billion medical devices in the United States each year use ethylene oxide. Both the FDA and EPA agree that ETO is critical to the sterilization of medical technology. For many of these devices, ETO sterilization is the only viable method. The gentle yet thorough nature of ETO allows for the sterilization of critical medical technologies and devices that would be destroyed and rendered unusable through other sterilization methods. Hundreds 
of thousands of, med of medical, hospital, and laboratory processes rely on ETO to sterilize devices and equipment to protect millions of patients from infectious disease. ETO sterilization capacity is currently at capacity, meaning long shutdowns or permanent closures would significantly disrupt patient access to sterile medical devices, significantly disrupt. The EPA's proposed NESHAP regulation and its fit for proposal are being put forward on a short implementation timeframe and with a very short comment period to try and digest and respond to a very long, complex set of rules. We request a longer comment period to help ensure sufficient time to review and comprehensively comment on this rule impacting patients and critical technology. We also ask the EPA to consider that medical device sterilization is only half of 1% of all commercial ETO use. To be clear, all parties involved are committed to one outcome of a safe sterilization process that protects employees and our communities surrounding these facilities and maintains an uninterrupted supply of the medical technology and medical supply chain that millions of American patients depend on every day. We are concerned that patients' access will immediately be at risk if the rules as proposed are finalized too quickly and do not reflect the input and guidance of toxicologists healthcare providers, medical technology companies, sterilizers, and patients. I thank you for your time to address this critical matter this evening. Thank you for your comments. Um, do any of the panelists have follow-up questions? I do. Um, you mentioned that you were interested in an extension. I didn't hear, uh, you mentioned how long you thought an appropriate extension would be. Did you have that in your remarks? I do not have those in prepared remarks, but I do know that there are currently up to 18 month wait times just to move from one sterilization facility to another. So the 18 month period is, is, is quite short for companies to be able to transfer over their technologies to new facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Abigail Trotter. Hi, I'm Abby Trotter. A-B-B-Y-T-R-O-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E Thank you for your time today and allowing me to comment on the EPA's recently proposed, recently released proposal for the regulation of ethylene oxide sterilizers. I'm the executive director of Life Science Tennessee, an association made up of in Tennessee companies, large and small, nonprofits and academic institutions that collaborate with each other as well as with government agencies to ensure a robust environment for access to quality medical products and biopharmaceuticals for patients. Our work includes a focus on collaboration to promote sound public policy that is supportive of our industry and its dedication and mission to the health of Tennesseans and those far beyond our state's borders through access to quality life science products and technologies that save lives and enhance the quality of lives. I speak today to express concern on the proposed rules as the EPA seeks to balance its mission for clean air and water against the FDA's mission for safe, effective medical technologies that reach patients. It seems to me the med tech industry and the EPA and the FDA are all committed to a safe sterilization process that protects employees and the communities that surround these facilities. The med tech industry and the FDA also seek to maintain an uninterrupted supply of medical technology and medical supplies for the millions of patients and physicians who depend on them daily. Specifically, I'm concerned that patient access to these technologies will be at risk if the rules as proposed are finalized too quickly and do not reflect the input and guidance of our industry, as well as toxicologists, healthcare providers, and patients. In fact, the EPA's own analysis reports that some sterilization facilities will close due to the implementation of these proposed rules. The FDA stated in 2019 that if one or more sterilization facilities closes, there would be a major disruption in the medical device supply chain, causing patients and provider shortages across our country. In Tennessee, this outcome will also impact local economy as Tennessee is home to a medical device cluster in Memphis. A quality sterilization facility is vital to the health of this important economic driver for Memphis and our entire state. If we don't have reasonable access to quality sterilization, we lose these jobs to areas outside of the country 
and across outside out out of the country and across across the world that do. According to a 2002 study released by the Greater Memphis Medical Device Council, more than 7,500 people are employed directly by the medtech industry in the Memphis area. And additionally, there is nearly 11,000 directly indirectly supported by the industry. This sector has seen an increase of nearly 2,000 employees since 2015. We urge the EPA to balance its determinations and prudently consider the use of ETO against the risk of lost sterilization capacity and the impact it will have on patients and the direct and indirect uh, employees that work in the med tech industry. Thank you for your time and for this process for allowing public comment on this important regulatory proposal. Thank you for your testimony. I'll turn to my panelists, my fellow panelists. Do either of you have any following uh, questions, follow-up questions? Not for me, Jim. Thanks. Not for me. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I have our next two speakers, Alejandra Frias and Janet Rao. Hello, my name is Alejandra Frias, A-L-E-J-A-N-D-R-A, -A -A, last name F-R-I-A-S. So to begin, I would like to express my appreciation for the opportunity to provide feedback on the proposed regulations. I am a student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and I'm an intern at Cleaner Now, which is an environmental justice organization. I have conducted undergraduate research in EJ communities and have lived among residents who are part of fenceland communities through friendships, colleague relationships, and student peers. Therefore, I support the immediate, considerate, and responsible phase out of as much ethylene oxide as possible to protect families who have already waited too long. In my opinion, fence line monitoring should be implemented to promote accountability and transparency since self-reporting, even under EPA regulations, is not practical and does not accurately capture all emissions and risks. The strictest rules should apply to stack and fugitive emissions, and it's, it's unacceptable that fugitive emissions have remained unregulated for so long. So I am pleased that this is an issue that is not in dispute. It's critical to implement stricter regulations for the safety of people who are risking their lives to benefit others by selling these products. It is apparent that EJ communities and groups seek stricter rules while larger companies and their chemists want to step back and analyze further. And I question how much evidence and research is needed for people to understand that ethylene oxide is harmful. The EPA has conducted studies, the most recent being in 2018, concluded that ETO is known is a known carcinogen in some industries were operating above the recommended thresholds. Workers in these facilities are often replaced when no longer needed, and we have even received personal testimonies from workers who were fired after getting cancer due to ETO exposure. Companies requesting such things are honestly very inconsiderate, so acceptable risks should not exist, as many other EJ organizations have already emphasized earlier. Although alternatives to sterilized products are available, some of them at least, more research needs to be conducted so this can be further. The easiest solutions are not always the best, of course, and this is the prime example. This issue is not merely a health problem, but also an economic benefit pursued at the cost of exposed communities, who are often communities of color, low income, and are already being exposed to pollution from other sources in their same neighborhood. Therefore, stricter regulations with enforcement and alternatives must be implemented. It was once believed that electrification was not an optimal solution, but now it's evident that it really is the future. Therefore, implementing stricter regulations and alternatives is feasible. Failing to do so safeguards corporations and companies while leading others to the same hospitals they claim to care about. So with this, I thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Are there any follow-up questions from the panel? No. Not for me. None for me. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker, Janet Well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Janet Rao. 
J-A-N-E-T-R-A-U. Um, I am a resident of um, Smyrna, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, um, and have been one of the leaders leaders of the Stop Sterogenics Georgia movement. Um, a couple of things that I think we're missing within the proposed rule, um, primarily um, the, the absence of warehouse um, inclusion. We have seen here in Georgia and in Willowbrook and in other markets that this industry uses um, warehouses and distribution centers to continue to off-gas um, ethylene oxide um, sterilized products um, and that that off-gassing um, results in thousands of pounds of ethylene oxide um, fugitive emissions. Um, and so by not including those facilities, we are um, missing a major source of, of ethylene oxide that's impacting our communities. Um, a study that was done for um, back to, for BD in, um, in Covington showed that their warehouse admissions um, in 2019 um, from a warehouse that they, they were operating um, added 5,600 5, pounds annually um, to the emissions in that community. Um, ambient air testing that was done in that area as well um, had um, um, levels within communities, um, fence line communities reach um, over the OSHA limit for workers for short time um, acute exposure. Um, so the absence of those warehouses is a major issue for, um, for this rule. Um, we have to regulate all sources of ethylene oxide, um, not just the most obvious ones. Otherwise, we're benefiting the companies um, in this type of activity that really increases the amount of ethylene oxide that we're seeing in communities. Um, to argue a little bit about what was presented by the um, by the industry, that it's um, a challenge to change products from ethylene oxide sterilization to other sterilization chains. Um, the FDA um, has an ETO um, sterilization master file program that they put in place um, to help facilitate that shift um, for companies in pre-market so that um, products that are being sterilized um, using ethylene oxide and can be sterilized using other methods can move to those other methods in an expedited manner. Um, the companies have had plenty of time. They have known. The IRA study came out in 2016. Um, there are documents from the Ethylene Oxide Sterilization Association um, showing that they knew the danger of ethylene oxide much longer ago than this. Um, and so they've had plenty of time to, to invest in these alternative methods, to invest in safer um, um, facilities, um, and they've chosen not to. So any type of delay um, is actually punishing the communities rather than punishing the, um, the companies that, that had this information and have had it for a very, very long time. Um, even 3M, who is a member of the Ethylene Oxide Sterilization Association, um, had to give guidance during the pandemic to not use ethylene oxide to sterilize their products, most specifically the N95 masks, because it is not appropriate. They cannot be off-gassed in time for their, their safe usage by medical personnel. Um, so the use of PPE during the pandemic um, as a reason to continue ethylene oxide sterilization at the level that it's been used um, is actually counterintuitive. Um, by sterilizing things like gowns and masks that just needed to be used by frontline workers actually kept them out of the hands of frontline workers um, for a much longer period of time than was necessary. So um, I appreciate your, your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'll turn to the panel to see if there are any follow-up questions. Did you, say, did you say that the Ethylene Oxide Sterilization Association knew that the risks associated with ETO were higher than the previous iris value before 2016? Um, if you subpoena their, um, the minutes from their meetings, yes, you'll see that uh, very clearly stated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And remember, this testimony will be transcribed, but if you would like to submit additional information, you can do so by submitting it to the docket. Okay. Our next two speakers will be Naomi Yoder and Jenny Schober. Great. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Naomi Yoder. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. My name is Naomi Yoder, N-A-O-M-I-Y-O-D-E-R. Um, I work for Healthy Gulf, a regional uh, Gulf of Mexico environmental nonprofit. We work on behalf of communities and ecosystems for the health of both. Thank you for these opportunities to offer comments on the ETO regulations. Many of the most polluting ETO facilities, the those facilities that are classified as of highest concern from the EPA are in Texas and Louisiana. Gulf Coast communities have been subjected to extreme pollution and adverse health effects from that pollution for many decades. We are also home to many environmental injustice communities um, as associated with that pollution. ETO is just one of the latest in this long line of pollutants that is um, continuing to ravage communities and inflict more injustice. That needs to stop and the, the regulations are a step in that direction, but um, we need the most stringent regulations possible and we also need to implement justice in those communities um, where that has not happened. So um, in addition to restricting emissions and um, increasing monitoring, so um, we also agree that um, with some of the comments that some other folks have raised that um, uh, fence line monitoring and continuous monitoring are critical. Also stack monitoring. Um, so both stack and fence line monitoring should happen um, at a facility that is known to emit ETO or that um, is a sterilization facility. Um, that monitoring should also, those data should be available to the public. Um, we deserve to know, we have the right to know uh, what's in our air and water and uh, what is affecting our public health. Um, so the regulations should include provisions um, around enforcing those things that we would have uh, continuous monitoring um, at several levels. So to capture both stack emissions and, um, and fence line or fugitive emissions as well. Um, this is just one step towards um, towards justice in some of the communities that I've mentioned. And there's the EPA could also be addressing some of that legacy pollution um, that is making the ETO crisis even worse. Um, there's if people that already have um, a, a large pollution burden might be more susceptible to um, some of the impacts of ETO, although it is quite um, a, a high toxicity uh, um, pollutant. Um, we have lots of tools for identifying environmental injustice and climate injustice communities than we've ever had before. So there's no reason why EPA should not be able to address some of these issues um, when we're talking about uh, ethylene oxide and sterilizers um, and chemical plants. Um, and when we're talking about, I'll wrap up, but when we're talking about sterilization, we also need to acknowledge where the ethylene oxide was manufactured. And in for the large part that's in Texas and Louisiana um, affecting our environmental justice communities um, right here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any follow-up questions from the panel? Not for me. None for me, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, our next speaker. Uh, my name is Jenny Shover, J-E-N-N-I-S-H-O-V-E-R. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Full disclosure, I am not a scientist. I am not a government official. I don't speak or pretend to understand the alphabet soup of agencies and acts at play here. I simply have the misfortune to be a 23-year resident of Smyrna, Georgia, living and working approximately 3.4 miles from a sterogenics sterilization facility. While your proposed actions mark a welcome start, they simply do not go far enough. Your proposed actions have gaps and loopholes that don't adequately protect this nation's citizens and communities. If I sound frustrated and angry, it's, it's because I am. I sat through last night's webinar and learned that your proposals will take literally years to result in any meaningful change. Please know that from our perspective, any measures that you take that rely on self-reporting are categorically worthless. Self-reporting is tantamount to the fox guarding the hen house, all while they are gaining financially in the process. I simply can't fathom why that would be acceptable to any regulatory agency, and I can assure you it's not acceptable to the community. Twice a year, self-reported data is offensive, insulting, and wholly inadequate. Communities like mine should not be put in the position of knowing that a dangerous and explosive car carcinogen is out there, knowing the exact source, knowing the major, the major health consequences, knowing the possibility of a catastrophic explosion, yet having to be poisoned, all while being asked to be patient as the process is worked out slowly over years and years. It is absurd, yet it is our real life. There should be swifter, more community protective options available when something as dangerous as ETO is confronted. I urge you to pursue swifter resolution. As a sacrificial lamb, my concern is not the supply chain or the availability of systems and equipment. Necessity is the mother of invention. Make it necessary and they'll figure it out. They've had a head start, they squandered, and it seems they may have more years yet to try to fight this. If they would stop whining about bananas and gas pumps and truck emissions and gas grills and naturally occurring ETO, we'd be halfway there because they don't want to isn't a sufficient enough reason. We know that there's big money at stake, but don't lose sight of the fact that there are real lives at stake as well. We need you to do better and we need you to regulate them into doing better sooner, sooner and faster. Detectors should be set up in such a fashion that we're able to see up to date, essentially real time monitoring results. After all, if they're doing such a good job, they should be willing, and I dare say proud, to share this data with us. If their fancy capture equipment is as supremely effective as the industry says it is, they should welcome all forms of impartial testing to eliminate the community's concerns about self-monitoring and self-reporting. And bonus, paying for all this is cheaper than settling lawsuits. Only somewhat sarcastically, I also suggest that over the next several years, you ask that the company executives live within two miles of a facility and work 40 hours a week on site. If it's safe, this shouldn't be an issue. If it will help prove that they are as harmless as they say, they should welcome it. Next, fence line and community ambient air monitoring is also a must. Ongoing real-time testing using the most current equipment within the facilities at the fence line and within the community to include immediately verifiable and publicly available results is the only approach that will deliver unquestionable accountability and transparency. Who does the testing, what equipment is used, where the testing happens, and when results are available are all collectively imperative. Due to time limits, I'm not going to get into the concerns about offsite warehouses and the need to close this loophole once and for all, nor will I delve into their delay tactics. Suffice to say that the industry has known about this for years. They've had time. Four minutes isn't enough time for me to discuss the very real need for disaster planning and audible alarms, which we hope we'll never need, but aren't naive enough to believe that we won't. It's time to give these regulations some teeth. I urge EPA and all related agencies and oversight authorities step up and protect the citizens of the country from ETO. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn to the panel to see if there are any follow-up questions. I have just one. Uh, when you mentioned independent testing, do you mean third-party testing or testing from uh, regulatory bodies or testing from the industry itself? I, I mean, I, I don't trust uh, from the industry itself, they've proven time and time again that they are not trustworthy. Um, so anything that's impartial, so any kind of third party or from the agency, mm. I, I would welcome. But as I mentioned, I'm not a scientist. All I can tell you is we do not trust for very good reason, mm. these companies and this industry. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So at this time, we don't have any other registered speakers for this time period. So I wanted to open it up to anyone that is currently in the session. If you would like to speak, I believe that you just need to send a chat um, to the attendee support and we can get you on to speak. Even if you're scheduled to speak later on this evening, you can go ahead and, and do that now. I'll give you a moment. Okay, attendee support, do we have any other folks that want to speak right now? Okay, what we will do is this, um, we'll take a short break. So again, my name is Jody Howard, and I've been chairing this um, hearing session. I want to thank everyone who has shared comments so far today on EPA's proposed action. If you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and our logistics team will reach out to you to let you know if there are any time slots available. At this time, we're going to take a short recess. We will resume the hearing, let's see, at about five minutes after six. Thank you all.
Welcome back from the break. My name is Jody Howard. I am the group leader of the Fuels and Incinerations Group within EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And I'm chairing this session of today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce ethylene oxide emissions from commercial sterilization facilities. As a reminder, we are providing Spanish interpretation for today's hearing. To listen to the hearing in either English or Spanish, everyone will need to select a language at the bottom of your screen. Click on the globe icon, then select either English or Spanish. Joining me on the panel are panelists. Would you please introduce yourselves? Sir, I'm Barrett Parker with the Measurement Policy Group. And I'm Tess Pettish. I'm in the Air Economics Group. Thank you. I want to remind you that today's hearing is being recorded and transcribed to produce a written transcript of the hearing. We will add this transcript to the public docket for this rulemaking and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. If you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you are joining us via the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Our logistics team will add you to today's agenda if there are any time slots available. Please note, by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. That includes rules of behavior. EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. The agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing event or meeting. EPA expects all participants, including panelists, registered speakers, and attendees to conduct themselves in a respectful, professional, and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. A quick reminder about providing testimony. When I'm calling you to speak, please unmute your line. While you're providing testimony, you are you also are welcome to activate your camera by clicking on the start video icon. Please state and spell your name for the record. A four minute timer will be started when you state your name. Okay, let's see. So again, if you would like to speak, please send a chat to the attendee support or star nine if you're on the phone. I don't see any speakers at this moment, but I'll give it a moment. Also, as a reminder, the comment period for the ethylene oxide commercial sterilizers NISHA will close on June 12, 2023. If you would like to register to speak during this public hearing, please send a chat to attendee support and they will get you registered so that you can give your testimony or comments. If you are on the phone and would like to provide testimony, please press star nine for assistance. Okay, my name is Jody Howard and I've been sharing this hearing session. I want to thank everyone who shared comments so far today on EPA's proposed action. If you have questions about today's hearing or are interested in registering to speak, please send a direct message to attendee support in the chat box. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing pound or star nine, sorry, and our logistics team will reach out to you and let you know 
and let you know when you're available to speak. Let me check one more time. Okay. Okay, I don't see any additional speakers at this time. So again, my name is Jody Howard. I am the group leader of the Fields and in Incineration Group. I have been sharing this hearing session. At this time, there are no additional registered speakers for this session. I want to thank my fellow panelists, everyone who offered testimony today, and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposal to reduce ethylene oxide emissions from commercial sterilized sterilization facilities. I would also like to thank my EPA colleagues with whom we would not have been able to put this uh, hearing together for today. So thank you everyone that has helped us make this a success. As a reminder, you can submit written comments on this proposal through June 12th, 2023. Thank you for joining us. Today's hearing will now adjourn. Have a good evening.